Hey what's up, it's cute what if this side. Today we will be seeing, what if overpowered Deku got harem. Now before we move ahead with the fic, leave a like and subscribe to the channel. For future what ifs like this. Friday. I start to get ready for my date with Achako. During one of our previous dates, I learned that she likes anything relating to space, so I'm thinking of going there together with her. The weather's pretty good too. Underneath a canopy of cerulean skies, the sun casts its golden rays like a painter's brush, illuminating the world with warmth and promise. A gentle breeze whispers through the air, carrying the scent of blooming flowers and fresh-cut grass. She seems pretty particular about my clothes, so I decided to put a little more effort into choosing what I wear on this date. It's a black semi-formal shirt under a green jacket and black pants. I don't have that many clothes, but it balances out being both stylish and comfortable if I do say so myself. Achako and I decided to meet up at the train station instead of taking off together from the dorms. Mostly, we don't want rumors to start going around, revealing my relationship with Achako. I'd say it's already too late for that, but this is also for Achako's peace of mind. Besides, Achako said this way it'll feel more date-like, whatever that meant. I walk through the crowded streets toward our meeting spot, only to find her being hit on by three guys I don't know. It seems she's blatantly ignoring them but they won't take the hint. Well, I'm sure she can ward them off without a problem, but the sight's still irritating me so I approach them. Hey uh, Achako didn't keep you waiting, did I I said, only to be hit with embarrassment the next moment. Hey uh, seriously, Izuku. One of the guys, the one with the mohawk, looked like he was thinking of intimidating me, only to gulp loudly once he saw the height difference between us. They look like a bunch of kids compared to me. I looked calmly into their eyes and said, scram, which is enough as they started running away at full speed. Hello, dear knight, Achako said. No worries. You're right on time, she told me. She really didn't pay them any mind, huh? I thought as I tried holding back my laughter. It's not going so well, so I tried changing the subject. Hey, Achako. Isn't that a little excessive the weather's not that cold outside? I told her, observing several layers of clothing she had on her person. In fact, it's not cold at all. Perhaps not to you, dearest knight. But then I have seen evokers shrugging off dragonfire. Compared to that, I guess even Japan's springtime temperature is not so bad. Don't enchanters have something to ward off the cold? Yes, we do. It is called clothing, she said with a playful grin on her face. Very funny, I said, which earned a giggle from her. We started boarding the train towards our destination in Ikebukuro. It's just a couple of stations away, so we were able to get there pretty quickly. To my surprise, not many people were at the station during this time for some reason. We spent the time with her in my arms, talking about small things. Kanaka Minolta Planetarium M-A-N-T-E-N. Oh why uh, it looks so good on the outside, she said, her eyes sparkling with excitement. Yeah, I've been wanting to go here for a while now. I heard the show they have is amazing, I said with a charming smile. We spent the time going from exhibit to exhibit. While it's true that the main attraction of this place is the show, there's more to it than that. They also have sections about heroes here, which I appreciated. There's even a section for 13th Sensei and her parents, Mercury and Vostok. Achikasar enchanted, for the lack of a better word, while looking at the meteorites exhibit. It was all fine and dandy until I started hearing her muttering something about magic circle formulas and something about tons of TNT while looking at it, which made me sweat a bit. The Ankai night sky seemed to stretch endlessly above me, a breathtaking tapestry studded with thousands of glittering stars. As my eyes traced the spiraling arms of the Milky Way galaxy, its ethereal glow enveloped us in celestial wonder. Beside me, Achako let out a hushed exclamation of awe. Can you believe this incredible view? Izuku her voice was barely above a whisper, heavy with reverence. I gave her hand a gentle squeeze, feeling a profound sense of peace and possibility wash over me in this sacred space beneath the cosmos. The delicate string of lights surrounding us cast an almost dreamlike ambience. After enjoying the displays and eating lunch for a bit, we enjoyed the show on top of what they called, the cloud seats. They weren't kidding. It truly does feel like I'm on top of the clouds here. That sure is a great show, huh? Truly, she said, her eyes sparkling not unlike the stars we've just watched just then. I've been reading quite a lot since we met. It said that Arthur's seat was one of the possible places Camelot was in. What do you think about that I asked her, flexing the little trivia I had about her homeland? No, she instantly answered before continuing. Camelot was originally located in what is now Kent. Was I asked about the weird choice of words as if she's saying. Merlin moved it into elsewhere when he built the court, she answered. Holy, wait, how do you move a castle? A city, and I do not know. It is the frustrating part of Merlin's feats, most magical tasks I can understand the underlying process. I may not have the power or skill to achieve them yet, but I can see the steps I would need to walk to get there. With much of Merlin's magic, there is no such path, she uttered in both awe and defeat, and possibly irritation at herself for not getting it. If you were to ask me, it only speaks volumes about Achako's talents. I may have more raw power than her, especially with the addition of OFA, but except for bashing heads, the power has little use with how little control I have on my part. What kind of magician was he I asked, curious about the legendary man. An enchanter probably she answered before settling into a thoughtful pose and continued, though judging by raw power, there may be evoker involved. 
and some of the old books refer to him as a sorcerer as well. So it's possible he was all of them. Achako says this, but it's obvious she herself doesn't fully buy it. It's because it's impossible to have two or more types of spark. But perhaps the reason he's so legendary was because he's the exception I wonder. Except ceremonial magic, I guess, I said in a joking tone. There is indeed no mention of him Yuli gratifying the monsters from the beyond. No, she said with a frustrated tone before going. Ark. What? I do not understand why I'm enrolled in that class, she said. I don't really mind, I said. Only because you get to ogle me indecently, she said while pouting. Well, not only because of that, I admit. No reason to lie here. She'd probably see through me anyway. But it certainly helps. It's fluff class, right like the social studies we have. Extra credits won't hurt. Perhaps. All my studies were with tutors before this. There was no fluff. Anyway, let's not spoil the mood. I love watching the stars with you today, I told her. Oh only today, my knight. You know what I mean, I said, which earned a giggle from her. Hehe. <laughs> it is certainly beautiful. And while this was never Camelot, you can sense the ley lines connecting here. It is a place of power. They sparkle in the night, she said. Hum I wonder if I'll be able to see them someday, I wondered out loud. I doubt it. Evokers rarely see ley lines, for much the same reason a flame rarely sees shadows. Your spark is too bright, it washes out the subtle shades of the world, she explained to me. I get it, but it's disappointing and. It's frustrating, how other people see these things in the world I'm blind to I said. Your power is still young, much of it will come with practice, she said before pulling out a deck of cards. Actually, there was a little trick my mother taught me. It might help you, she said enthusiastically. Wait, is that a pack of cards I said. What is it with magic and playing cards never mind? So, how do we do this? First, hold my hands, she said while holding out both of her hands. Is this so you can create a bond for the magic I asked? Curious what we were going to do. No, my hands are cold, and yours look nice and warm, she said. Finally, hand-holding how lewd, I joked inside my head while reaching out to both her hands. She's not kidding, it's pretty darn cold. Did she go through a freezer or something? Better I asked while holding her hands and wrapping my arms around her shoulder. Yes, thank you, Sir Knight. I am anus to this temperature. It is always summer at the court. Arthur was the summer king, after all. Never mind the lack of air conditioning, she told me before continuing. Sauskering. It is a simple enough spell. Focus on the cards and channel magic into them, she said. Like this I said while putting down a single one pair to the cards. Gently, gently, dearest knight. Not everything requires the sledgehammer of evoker might, she said. This is gently, I said, trying to lower the output, which is a challenge in of itself, but I seem to have managed a little. Okay, Saja's cares the cards limiting the output is taking most of my concentration, and talking on top of that is like trying to balance an umbrella with your tongue while riding a unicycle. The cards, Izuku. Not my hands, she said with a grin on her face, but her blush can't be missed from this close. He hey. Okay I think I've got it. I can feel the cards responding, I said. The feeling's quite novel, to say the least. You are still using ridiculous amounts of magic, but at least the cards are not in danger of combusting this time. Next up, focus your mind on someone, and draw a card. The deck will respond, she guides me through the process. How about you I asked. Okay, I will be a mid-tier diamond card suit. Diamonds for enchanters. Hearts for healers. Clubs for the weaker powers, and I would guess ceremonial magicians. And spades for evokers. The suit of war and power, she explained to me. And why mid-tier isn't your family a line of powerful mages I asked, confused. We are, but I am still young, and inexperienced, she said. We could fix that, you know I told her with a smile. Stop smirking and focus on the cards, she rebuked me but I'm not missing the slight upturn of the edge of her lips. South card changes over time I asked, going back to the topic of scrying. Everything changes over time. The person changes, and so the card will change to match the reality it mirrors, she told me. It's awfully interesting and convenient. I can already see a few ways to make use of this in the future. Gotcha. So, focus on you and draw a card. You do not need to focus quite that hard. You are intense enough as it is. Sorry. Let's see I said while doing as she said. The card turned up to be. The Queen of Diamonds. That is not right, she said, confused. Got the suit right, at least, I told her. The high cards are all powers. My father is the Jack of Diamonds. But while I may one day be one, I am certainly not a power today, she explained before continuing. Put aside that card and try again. So I did. And the result did not change. Still the Queen of Diamonds. What in the name of the horned one is going on she said, confused, while checking the card out. Looks like you're the queen in my heart, regardless of what your rules say, I told her, slightly tightening my hold on her palm to express my feelings. That is sweet of you, Izuku. But magic does not work like that. You keep saying that. You're a terrible influence on me. What's next? Well, who else do you want to scry? She asked. Him why not Ashidosin? Ah yes, the young ceremonial magician. Why did your thoughts jump straight to her, Izuku? She said while looking intensely at my face. She's smiling, but I feel like she's not being happy right now. Is Shedulous. Just curious nothing else, I swear, I told her. 
I'm okay then, she lets go of the topic for now. I drew a card and pulled Yupa Queen of Clubs. Another queen in your heart, my knight she asked, her smile scaring me a little right now. If I didn't know any better, I could be convinced that you were a randy lecher. This time her tone is more teasing than the previous cold fury. Of course, I won't point out that I am. I'm not dumb. Totally not, I told her. Though it felt as if the card furred. Strange. She said before returning the card to the deck. Could be just your imagination. Let's try Nana this time, I told her, which earned raised an eyebrow from her. Your fellow evoker. Yeah, I said as I drew the card and got. The queen of spades. What the heck? Aha, Ochako said to me. Sure you don't have something to tell me, sir knight. Dang it, what's happening here? No, it's just simple flirting here and there. Nothing more than that, I explain myself. Again, the suit is correct the value s plea is not. Shimurasen has the potential to be a power, but she is still young and untested. Who else do you want to try she said, seemingly dropping the subject. How about Midnight Sensei? You are unlikely to get anything from her. Sorcerers tend to distort the laws of magic, and one of the side effects is that they are impossible to scry, she explained. Let's try anyway, I said, wondering what happens. And I drew. Rear of the card again, what the heck? There you are, she said, completely expecting this confusing result. Wait, so this card has two rear sides how does that even work? That is sorcery for you. Exactly what it will do is anyone's guess, but I've never successfully scryed a sorcerer, she said. Weird. Let's try my healer friend, Yui, I told her. A little excited because of how weird it is. So I drew the card and got. A jack of hearts. Huh. That's unexpected, to say the least. Did I just hear Achako breathe a sigh of relief? Well, at least she is not another queen, she said. Her eyes half closed. We're not like that I swear. I told her, my hands gesturing raised and palms facing her. Same thing, Huso, this is not just random there is logic at work here, Achako said, contemplating what this all means. Sadly, it's not my expertise so I can't exactly help provide alternative explanations. I wonder what it is she said while snuggling closer to my embrace. This is most curious. The scrying spell is simple enough that a child could do it. And you are getting it wrong, somehow. Well, why don't you try it? Nothing should change there. But if it makes you happier. Who should I scry she asked, readying to draw from the deck. The amount of magic is something I can barely sense. How about Mina I just blurted out the name that seemed innocuous enough. She drew a card and pulled up a queen of clubs. She is still coming up queen of clubs. What have you done to my scrying? Izuku she said, seems ready to pounce on me at any moment. And not the fun kind of pouncing. I'm innocent. Try scrying yourself and see what happens. I said, where she simply shook her head. You cannot scry yourself. And even if I could, I fear it would just give me the same results as you had. It appears you have corrupted the ritual itself. And I have zero idea how, she explained to me, which gave me a little idea. Why don't you try scrying me I suggested. I already did. After the first time we met with the Minotaur. You are a three of spades. Maybe a four or five now. Your powers are growing at a frightening pace, she told me. Try it, anyway, I insisted. Sure, she said while drawing from a card. I wait. What is going on? Izuku who are you she said, her tone grim before letting me see her card. It's a joker card. Hum looks like another distorted reading. This is a 52 card deck. It does not have a joker. Never have. I've only seen this she paused, before suddenly coming to a realization. Are you a sorcerer? The only times I have seen this have been when trying to scry a sorcerer. Not that I know. And it worked the first time, right? Everyone's been telling me my father's a god or something. Maybe he was a god of gambling or cards or something. I threw the idea and see if it made sense to her. It does not work like that. Divine makes you stronger and tougher, but you do not gain their primary characteristics. The son of a god of gambling would not manipulate cards, any more than the son of the horned god would be born with antlers, she explained. My mom's like the least magical person ever. Nobody in my family on her side has any connection to magic. It can't be her, I told her. And yet a power chose her. Why, I wonder. Cute, hot, and willing isn't that the story of most of these girl meets god tales I asked her. The willing part is largely optional. But this was not a casual fling on your father's part. Your mother, your location, everything was planned. What does a god fear, to hide his offspring like this and what did he see in your mother? Wait, so you think he picked my mother specifically for this that I'm some kind of breeding experiment I asked her. It is possible. Sorcery is found in the lines furthest from magic. Evokers are found only in the mingling of divine with the human. A sorceress evoker would be quite scary, to be honest with you, she said with a tone lacking in playfulness. Why do you say that? Sorcerers have an uncanny ability to find what they need. And evokers have the raw force to take what they want. The two together have the potential to become a god in their own right, she explained, still a little shaken by the possibility. Is that what I am a sorceress evoker? Well, I at least don't feel like a sorcerer. There's no nudges or hints, no controlling entity pulling my strings or giving me directions, I told her. Surely, I have felt things before, like the time when I first met Achako, but it seems different from how sorcerer's powers are described to me. 
Granted, I only have one sample, but still. And evokers rarely become powerous. They tend to burn out gloriously in quixotic last stands before their power matures. Achako's tone is sad as if almost anticipating it's the same future I'll reach someday. Don't worry, I have no intention of dying. I hugged her tighter and gave her the most reassuring smile I could do. A worthy goal. It is a pity no evoker has ever thought that way before, she said in playful sarcasm. But she leaned further into my embrace. Izuku, she said, her tone surprisingly meek while looking at my face. Evokers almost always follow the same pattern. They keep raising the stakes, fighting stronger and stronger opponents, defending hopeless causes, and fighting lost battles until one day their luck runs out. Her words reminded me of what I answered to All Might right after the USJ incident. Perhaps. I don't want to die, honestly. But if it meant I'd be saving one more life, I don't mind paying the ultimate price. Is that how those evokers thought? And if their luck holds, they become gods I do not know. None of the gods are particularly forthcoming with their origins. But it is certainly possible, even without adding sorcery to the mix. Would your father be happier about you dating a god I asked, trying to find the angle where I could openly go out with Achako without her dismissing her duty? My father has no great love for gods, Izuku, she said. In my mind, I think how troublesome her father is. And even if you somehow survive to reach godhood, that's a hundred years or more into the future I rather fear I will be married off before that, she said. Hey, you already had one suitor get blown up. I could get you a t-shirt that said, my real boyfriend is an evoker battle mage hero. Maybe that would keep away unwanted advances. I told her, half joking but half serious. I better search up sites that do custom shirts at home. This earned a giggle from her. Heh <laughs> heh. My father would have conniptions. Poor Lord Yarkow's family, they would be furious, she told me. But you'd still like one, right? Oh, yes. Though I would only wear it in private. Or with you. So I'm being upgraded to boyfriend, then. Does that come with a? Izuku I. It's the fifth date. Surely, the rules allow for on the fifth date. Fourth she said, splitting hairs. Fifth. I count the study date. The rules have a lot to say about chastity, and not a lot to say about dates or ease, she said. Then I doubt they'd approve of this, I said as I at her. A gentle one. MHMMM surprised by the act, Achako didn't know how to react. MHMMMHMM she lets out a, her left hand finding itself wrapped around my neck, her right caressing my hair. They eventually became more passionate, with our tongues getting involved. Eventually, we let go but not without my tongue caressing her lips first. HMMMMM. See that wasn't so bad, I told her. I do not know perhaps I would need to try again to be certain, she told me. Her eyes closed as she closed the distance between our lips. Happy to oblige, I told her. MMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMM
I will protect it as I can, and hopefully, I will leave a stronger court for my own children. One where they can marry for love, not for duty. Damn it, Ochako. SHHHHH let us just enjoy this moment. Who knows how many more we'll have. Okay, but it's still bullshit, I said as I held her tightly. Thank you, Izuku, for the wonderful date, and for being there for me. We stayed there for the rest of the time allowed. By the time we walked out of the planetarium, it was already nighttime so we rode the train to go back to UA. The entire time, we're in each other's hands, seemingly inseparable. We wait outside the dorms. Good night, for now, dear night. I will I will always treasure the memory of today. Her face seemed ready to cry at any moment. Hey, this isn't over yet. We can spend as much time together as we want, I said, which somehow cheered her up. You are of course correct. My thoughts have run ahead of me, so I will see you later, she said. Kanashu Ashup, everyone I'm your favorite invisible girl of class 1A, Hagakir Toru right now. My friends and I are in a bar where my crush one of our classmates, Midoriya Izuku, works at. Initially, his towering stature and that heated exchange with Ada during the entrance exam had me pegging him as a bit of a brute. But when he'd swooped in and rescued me with those chiseled arms and commanding presence, I was utterly smitten. The way he exuded authority while marshalling the rescue efforts, his crisp citrus scent that made me want to bury my face in his my poor heart couldn't help but go doki doki. Speaking of the ambience of the bar, the air was thick with the comforting aroma of freshly roasted coffee mingling with the oaky notes of premium whiskey from the well-stocked bar. A harmonious chorus of clinking glasses, soft laughter, and the occasional crack of a cue against felt-lined rails filled the space. Exposed brick radiated a warm, inviting glow complemented by vintage filament bulbs suspended from the ceiling. Smooth jazz crooned from the speakers, blending with the murmurs of conversation and sporadic cheers from sports fans glued to the TVs. Overstuffed leather booths beckoned weary patrons to sink into their plush embrace, while polished wooden tables provided a stable foundation for drinks and appetizers. The scarlet felt of the pool table was a siren's call to challengers, its sleek cue sticks gliding effortlessly through skilled hands. Each lovingly curated detail. From the artwork adorning the walls to memorabilia celebrating local sports legends, imbued the neighborhood haunt with a quintessential charm and intimate togetherness. Unfortunately, I have not had the chance to say my Araga thanks to him since that day, as he always seemed preoccupied whenever our paths crossed. Not helping matters was Achikachi's inadvertent territory marking whenever he was around, though the girl herself seemed oblivious to her actions when questioned. Isn't this bordering on stalker behavior Kaiwachi I muttered, ever the skeptic regarding our motivations. Don't be ridiculous, Kaiyukachin Minichi I chided, eyes hungrily tracing every ripple of Izuku's physique from across the room, her flushed cheeks nearly matching her hair. We're just three gal pals enjoying a harmless girls' night at the bar closest to campus. It's hardly our fault the great a hunk from our class happens to work here. I couldn't fault her logic or her reaction, for that matter. Even from this distance, Izuku's presence exuded an unshakable sense of security, and trustworthiness, like nothing unsavory could ever transpire under his watchful gaze. Weird, but also reassuring. Minichi I had been in an incredibly foul mood for days, but thankfully she'd bounced back and suggested this girl's night out. The three of us Minichi I, Kaiwachi I, and myself had made our way to the bustling bar. We'd invited Achikachi I, but she had classes. Mamachi I was Mia from the dorms, while Tsuchi I had returned home to help with her siblings during the break. She's right, Kaiwachi I besides, I chimed in, gesturing toward a group of burly, green-skinned patrons guzzling what appeared to be cheap meat. I bet plenty of guys are here hoping to catch a glimpse of Midnight Sensei serving drinks. Still, this was certainly an eclectic establishment. The clientele alone were unconventional, to say the least. One table hosted a group of diminutive folk with beaked mouths and dish-shaped indentations filled with water atop their heads. Another housed what seemed to be a green-skinned couple with protruding ears, one bald, the other with crimson hair braided over her shoulder deaning alongside a talking donkey. Quirky quirks, indeed. Meanwhile, you two are just here to ogle Midoriya, Kaiwachi I accused with the roll of her eyes. Oh, Muyamateki dasked up, Kaiwachi I, I teased. You act like you didn't have a nosebleed alongside my Dakun when we saw him shirtless during the battle trial. Thankfully for her, she'd managed to discreetly wipe away any evidence before anyone else noticed. But my keen eyes had caught every tantalized drop. A-I-A-W-H she sputtered, cheeks flushing scarlet as Minichai landed the final blow. And let's not forget how you kept pressing your jacks to his room door at night, touching yourself. Minichai's hushed giggles only compounded Kaiwachi's mortification as she frantically tried to salvage her dignity. Chu wasn't I've told you, I was just crouching awkwardly and you saw me from a weird angle I thought I heard something suspicious, so I listened in. I'm not a pair of perverts like you two. Sure you weren't, Minichai and I chorused, our tones dripping with sarcastic disbelief at her feeble excuse. Hey there, girls what's a guy gotta do to get your attention around here a man with dark brown hair and his twenties sauntered over, clad in a studded black leather biker jacket, faded jeans, and boots. We exchanged knowing glances, utterly disinterested in whatever pickup line was about to be deployed. 
Ignoring his attempt at conversation seemed the wisest course. He wasn't being outright rude, but engaging felt like a hassle none of us wanted. Eventually, Kaiwachi I spoke up with a deadpan delivery. Sorry, but the three of us are already taken. We only have eyes for our boyfriend. For the briefest fur, her gaze shifted towards a certain emerald-haired man before snapping back. Oh, I mused, struggling to stifle a giggle. Now, did she do that because he's a bouncer we may have to call in case there's trouble? Or is it Yufifufu? The rejected suitor seemed to deflate, all bravado dissipating. Ah, uh, all right then. Good evening to you ladies. He stood, dejected, and ambled off into the crowd. The man seemed dejected at the blatant rejection. I kind of felt sorry for him. We girls continued our conversation for a while and eventually, we ran out of our drinks. I went to get us new drinks and Midnight Sensei said to me, If you want my bouncer at your table, you just have to give an extra 5,000 yen. The bartenders, our own teachers, bold proposition hung heavy in the air, both tantalizingly taboo and deliciously tempting. My sensible side urged an immediate rebuff, but a darker curiosity took root. The prospect of his undivided attention, unfettered by professional obligations, proved irresistible. And the idea of compensating for his mere presence, to entertain us at our whim, ignited an illicit thrill low in my belly. Is that okay I heard myself ask, voice hushed with hesitation as propriety warred with prurient desires. Soliciting his companionship while on the clock seemed questionable at best. She was unruffled, shrugging indifferently. It's not exactly a madhouse tonight. A little holler would get his attention if need be. The words tumbled from my lips before I could reconsider. Um, okay. I passed her the requested sum, my pulse thundering with a heady blend of exhilaration, and discomfited guilt. Was I really doing this? All right then. She pocketed the cash smoothly. Izuku, why don't you go entertain our clients for a bit? She angled her chin towards our table. I'll have your drinks sent over shortly. I slunk back to my seat, butterflies swarming as I tracked his purposeful strides in our direction. The crowd seemed to part instinctively, as if compelled by an unseen force to clear a path for this being. His approach was like witnessing a cosmic phenomenon. At once inexorable, awe-inspiring, and vaguely overwhelming. The charged tension was palpable, radiating from my friends in waves as they too drank in the vision rapidly closing the distance between us. He's wearing a black shirt with bold, white graphics emblazoned upon it. At the top, the word bouncer stands out in an authoritative font, immediately catching the eye and leaving no ambiguity as to the subject matter. Beneath this declarative text lies the stylized visage of a bouncer or security guard, a pair of rectangular sunglasses giving an air of cool detachment, while a thick, exaggerated mustache suggests a non-nonsense demeanor. This minimalist representation, rendered in stark white against the Inkai backdrop, manages to capture the essence of the profession with a wry, almost comedic flair. They say good things come in threes, but tonight, it seems the trifecta of beauty has graced this humble bar, he purred with a wink, serving our drinks with practiced ease. A frozen strawberry day query for me, a spicy margarita for the fiery minichii, and a crisp gin and tonic with a lemon twist for the shy but curious kaiwachii. Three radiant ladies, three distinctive drinks, one enthralling vibe. Here's to a night brimming with endless possibilities. His silky voice caressed the words, laden with unspoken promises. Possibilities indeed, I mused, stifling a girlish giggle. Thankfully, the seats in front of me were occupied, allowing him to slide in beside my invisible form. Minichiai and Kaiwachiai's pouts only fueled my smug satisfaction. I must be sporting the smuggest grin in the world right now. Thankfully, I'm invisible. He hey. Oh, shoot I'd nearly forgotten my manners. By the way, I haven't properly thanked you for rescuing me at the entrance exam. I cooed, snaking an arm around his bicep and drinking in his intoxicating scent. As thanks, I'd love to spend some quality time with you, if you catch my drift. Unlike my gorgeous friends, I couldn't entice with looks alone, but a girl had other means of arousing interest. Had his muscles grown even more impressive than that cologne. Utterly divine. Hey, hands off don't monopolize the gratitude Mina chided with the playful swat of her hand. Take us along for the ride too. Wh why am I being lumped in with you shameless husses Kaiwachi I sputtered, her cheeks flushing adorably. You don't have to come if you really don't want to, Minichi I replied, lips curling into a salacious grin. But are you absolutely sure she turned her hungry gaze back to our bouncer Adnis? All right, I guess it's just Torichin and me then. I never said I didn't want a Kaiyuka blurted, flustered. Yer yer tsundarichi I can't be sun honest with her feelings. I'll let you lovely ladies know when I've got some free time, he promised, his large hand finding purchase on my waist and giving an affectionate squeeze. Did he really just oh my, was it suddenly quite hot in here? Wait, you're making us wait Mina whined, more affronted by the implication than the delay itself. Good girls can and will wait patiently, he chided in that rich, commanding tone that made my knees weak. And you are a good girl, aren't you? Minichi I could only nod meekly, cowed by his dominant presence. It's not unpleasant by any stretch of the imagination. In fact me heart went doki doki again on that part. Seems like he's the duess type. If anyone else tried that on us, they'd be going home permanently sterile. But for some reason, rather than resentment, his authoritative words kindled an unfamiliar ache within me, a yearning to submit, to relinquish control. 
like he would never overstep our boundaries, only push them tantalizingly farther. I found myself pressing closer, head resting against the solid comfort of his shoulder. What if I wanted to be a bad girl, though the wanton thought came unbidden, and my eyes were instantly drawn to his powerful hands, a blazing heat coiling low in my belly. Get a grip, Toro. I didn't want him to think I was some sort of deviant. At least, not yet. After that charged exchange, our conversation meandered through various topics. I learned so much about the complex man, his fervent admiration for heroism, his drive to save lives, and his forward-thinking aspiration to start his own business post-hero career. Quite the multifaceted too soon, the dorm curfew loomed, and we reluctantly prepared to depart while he intended to work late into the night. The exact location of where he'll stay remained a mystery. Sienara I called with a cheerful wave as we ambled back to the dorms, our rapport more comfortable than ever before. Toru, Kaiwachi I began once we were out of earshot. I've been wondering were you compensating him for, you know, services rendered. She was referring to the generous tip I'd left before our exit. No, of course not just leaving an appropriate gratuity for his stellar hospitality. Didn't the evening just fly by thanks to him? Minichi I chimed in with a sly grin. You say that, but we all saw you slip some cash to come dote on our table. Are you sure you're not just living out some sugar mommy fantasy? Or is she just a hopeless simp Kaiwachi I snickered? I opened my mouth to protest, but the words died on my lips. No point in denying it now. Okay, fine, you got me. The dynamic is intriguing, and I have some disposable income. But I don't plan on making it a regular thing, I admitted with a nonchalant shrug, desperately hoping to change the subject. Unfortunately, my friends weren't so easily dissuaded, pressing the matter relentlessly, until we reached the dorms. Daoshite is this happening to me? I drew POV. What's up? My dude's your boy Kirishima Ijiru is in the house I hollered, joining my buddies Ajiro, Sato, and Shoji at the gym for an epic manly muscle building session this was gonna be 100% plus ultra. Right now, we're at the gym inside UA training our manly muscles its walls lined with photos of past graduates, heroes who've gone on to do incredible things. It's like a shrine to greatness, reminding us of the legacy we're striving to uphold. The walls were lined with photos of past pro heroes, UAS legacy etched into every inch. It was like a freaking shrine to greatness, reminding us of the legends we aspired to follow in the footsteps of. The air was electric, filled with the clangs of weights and the roars of sheer willpower from my bros. Every corner pulsed with the energy of students pushing past their limits. This place was a straight-up battlefield, but instead of villains, we were waging war against our own weaknesses. And the equipment bro, it was like something ripped straight from a superhero F weights that'd make pro bodybuilders drool. Treadmills that could give the speedster a run for his money, and punching bags rugged enough to withstand even Bakugou's explosions. Then there was the arena, the gym's pulsing heart. This sacred ground is where we put our sweat and tears to the ultimate test, clashing in full contact bouts that forged us into absolute units. But more than that, it's where unbreakable bonds were made, romances that would transcend our school days. You feeling okay there? Kirishima Ajiro asked, giving me a puzzled look. You seem even more amped than usual. I've got to agree, Shoji chimed in, his mouth hands contorting. You're rivaling Sato after downing a family-sized bag of sugar. Sato just nodded sagely nearby, already prepping for his workout. Are you kidding me? Bros I bellowed, eyes blazing with determination. We've got insanely talented classmates leading the charge we can't let them leave us eating their dust. We've gotta level up and stand beside them as true equals. Memories of the USJ attack furred through my mind. If only I'd been stronger, I could have contributed more instead of watching helplessly as my friends battled for their lives. Nothing disastrous happened, thank god, but what if Midoribro hadn't been there to save our asses next time? Midoribro and our teachers getting injured during that chaos had really shaken me. It forced me to confront the harsh reality that when the chips were down, I'd been utterly useless, just like that helpless, scrawny kid I thought I'd left behind long ago. That villainous onslaught had made my resolve waver. Never again. I was going to become the embodiment of Red Riot a true hero. You can't keep up with him, Bakugu's gruff voice cut through my reverie as he entered, already donning his workout gear. Any progress you make, he'll match it twice over with half the effort. The best we can hope for is not getting caught in the damn crossfire like those third-rate punks last week. His blunt words sliced deep, but they rang with an undeniable truth. From the moment I first laid eyes on Midoriya, I knew he was operating on another level entirely. The dude was bigger than freaking All Might himself, after all. Even so I muttered, eyes blazing with rekindled fervor, I'll keep striving to shine alongside my friends. Even if it seems hopeless, I'll be damned if I don't try. My bros shared concern looks but said nothing. You you oh 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 hh let's get hyped and blessed by the iron god's eye roared, desperately rallying us. Moping never got anyone anywhere. It was time to walk the walk. Back you go POV. Keep up, my ass, I muttered under my breath, donning my workout attire and special quirk-resistant gloves. I approached the punching bag, starting with a measured pace before progressively increasing the intensity of my strikes, punctuating each blow with a controlled explosion. 
No need for introductions any self-respecting individual knows the name Bakugu Katsuki. You extras can refer to me as Bakugao-sama for the remainder of your insignificant lives. What's at my current activity I'm training? Obviously that damn Izuku, showing off during the USJ incident. It pisses me off bam bam boom even more infuriating were that blue-haired bastard, and the misty freak. Next time I cross paths with them, I'll blast their asses into oblivion. Oh, oh class 1A hitting the gym, how the USJ attack must have really shaken you, a familiar, grating voice sneered. The others tensed at the blonde idiot's words, thick lips looking ready to put him in his place. The hell do you want? Monomai growled, my patience already waning. Apart from the time I gave him a well-deserved black eye, I'd had minimal interaction with the moron though for some asinine reason, the nerd had befriended him afterward. Best to deal with this nuisance swiftly, a fight risk teacher intervention, disrupting my training session. Oya it seems that Bakugaukuns graced us with his presence he said with an exaggerated flair before continuing. Tell me, when those dastardly villains descended upon USJ, did your boots quake and fear a mere waste of oxygen while I'd wager Midoriya was the sole combatant tsk tsk? Such an aptitude would never befall the illustrious Class 1B. Proof positive of our superiority over you extras of 1A. Before he could continue his idiotic diatribe, Izuku's harem member swept in, chopping the back of Monoma's neck with impeccable timing. My rapidly dwindling patience appreciated the intervention. Sorry about that, everyone she apologized, her presence visibly flustering both thick lips and plain face. Pathetic as if they'd never laid eyes on a woman before. No worries shitty hair assured her from the treadmill, ever affable. Speak for yourself, shitty hair. Just get that extra out of here, and we're square, I told her, eager to resume my training regimen. A stray thought crossed my mind. You're not cheating on Izuku with that loser, are you? Her expression morphed into one of pure, unbridled fury as if I'd tortured her entire family before her eyes. Do you mean, Bakugu want me to rip your tongue out right here? I recoiled slightly, a thin sheen of sweat betraying my composure. I will never betray Izuku in any way. You disgust me for even entertaining such a vile notion. TCH, all you had to say was no. No need to blow in gasket, I scoffed, deliberately avoiding her piercing glare as I returned to my workout. That unhinged look had me questioning whether I'd end up an extra among extras at this rate. Tenya POV. Good evening I'm Ida Tenya from Class 1A. Before UA, I studied in the prestigious school called Sumi Academy. We, as of this moment, strolled back towards the dormitories, our small group having just returned from an excursion to the nearby mall. Damn it why is Midoriya the only one getting all the chicks mind to kun suddenly erupted, his voice carrying towards the heavens. Our gazes followed his line of sight to spot Ashidokun, Jirokun, and Hagakirikun waving coyly at Midoriya-kun from a bar's entrance. Moments later, a girl with vibrant orange hair styled into a side ponytail appeared, snaking her arm around his in a conspicuously intimate manner before ushering him inside. Ordinarily, I would have been the first to admonish such frivolous dalliances, but seeing as we were off campus and he of legal age, I found myself unable to voice any objections. And he's got another one damn it, why is life so unfair Kaminari Kun's lament joined Maita Kun's chorus of dismay. He's strong, heroic, and charismatic, Todoroki Kun interjected, his gaze inexplicably fixed upon his left hand. Rather than wallowing in despair over the attention he receives from the opposite, why not learn from his example instead? An insightful observation, Todoroki Kun. I nodded in agreement. However, such overt promiscuity does not befit one aspiring to become a hero. I shall have to discuss this matter with Midori Akun at a later juncture. While I held no official title, I still felt compelled to guide my esteemed classmates toward the path of righteousness, Midori Akun, our vice president, being among those most in need of such guidance. Nito POV. Why in the world did you stop me there? Kendo I asked our class president why she would do such a thing. Has she no pride in our illustrious class 1B for those unaware? Allow me to introduce myself I am Mono Manito, the resident phantom thief, a side character destined to outshine even the protagonists we currently found ourselves in the class 1B dormitory's communal area, where I sought to dissect the earlier incident. I stopped you because your antics were about to instigate a needless clash between classes Kendo retorted, her brow furrowed. A clash we would undoubtedly emerge victorious from I proclaimed confidently. Are you truly that dense she scoffed. Izuku alone could have overpowered most of our class single-handedly. Perhaps, but not you. Surely you possess a fighting chance against him, I countered. Kendo adopted a defensive stance. You underestimate him. In most scenarios, I would be soundly defeated. And that's assuming I'd even entertain the notion of raising a hand against him. Ha? Huh? Yes, I nearly forgot you're his bibigwe, I remarked, my words cut off as she effortlessly executed a chokehold, lifting me from the ground like a wrestling legend of old. Be careful, Monoma. One day, you might simply vanish, she warned, her sickeningly sweet smile a stark contrast to the ominous words. Her expression hardened, the sweet facade crumbling. And only Izuku has the privilege of calling me that. 
Understood. I could only numbly nod in acquiescence, my sense of self-preservation outweighing any desire to protest. A rosy blush bloomed on her cheeks as she added, Speaking of Izuku, I plan to spend some time in his company, so don't go causing trouble that will jeopardize our time together. Where else? Her thinly veiled threat hung in the air as she retreated to her room, emerging moments later, primped for her rendezvous with her paramour. Urg. It was mere minutes after her departure that the adorable Kanoko descended the stairs, surveying our common area. Has anyone seen Itsuka, Shroom? Sensing an opportunity, I replied, she went to meet her darling Izuku. Kanoko's surprised expression spurred me onward. Such an awful friend, not only abandoning you but running off to spend time with your high school crush. Why don't we take a stroll to get your mind off it I suggested with feigned concern. Kanoko's repulsed grimace and succinct you, Shroom deflated my hopes as she promptly exited, following in Kendo's footsteps. I stood there, petrified by her unambiguous rejection. What was with the saying that the worst she could say is no? I woke up early morning to get to the class. I guess it's time for another ceremonial magic class this morning. Now that I think about it, I wonder how the homework went for those two. I think like a house on fire is probably accurate. I know Sarah is just trying to stir some trouble, but I can't deny she's also helping me get closer to Achako. So long as I'm careful, I might even get out of it alive. Stealing my resolve, I descended the stairs towards the communal area, only to find a visibly sullen Ashidasen station there, likely awaiting Achako's arrival. The last time we'd crossed paths, her spirits had seemed lifted, which made her current poutiness all the more perplexing. Claiming the couch beside her, I dd an arm around her shoulders in a comforting embrace. What's the matter a smile suits you far better, I murmured, using my free hand to gently raise her chin, our eyes meeting. The melancholic air surrounding her tugged at my heartstrings. Whatever had her so down, I found myself wanting to chase away the shadows and restore the infectious radiance I'd come to expect from the vibrant Ashidasen. Midori Ashidasen greeted with a sullen pout, the usual bubbly personality drained from her demeanor. She hugged me tight with both arms before starting. It's just Nana. You cannot imagine what an absolute she was. I've never been so angry. Concern furrowed my brow as I listened intently. As an evoker like myself, I knew Nana didn't harbor the highest opinion of ceremonial mages. But Ashido had always been an exception in my eyes. What happened I asked gently. Her rant continued, indignation blazing. And what's up with that stupid dress code that's got to be a title AX violation or something? If I knew I'd have to strip down to my skivvies in front of that witch, I would have worn actual underwear she continued. And then I'm like nobody needs to know if we just skip it, right Ashido went on, voice edged with desperation. And you know what that said. I could only hazard a guess. Death is lighter than a feather, duty is heavier than a mountain. What no, dude, she scoffed, clearly more affronted than I could fathom. She said she was enjoying watching me squirm and refused to let me off the hook. Like, what the? Yeah, it sounds very different from my study session with Achako, I offered, hoping to steer the conversation more positively. The girl's differing circumstances made comparing apples to hand grenades. Of course it was different for you too, Ashido snapped, though her venom wasn't directed at me. Did you know her family's like, totally loaded like, the royal family looks downright impoverished in comparison. I shook my head, unruffled by matters of material wealth. It honestly hasn't come up. I assume royalty has money, but I don't see what the big deal is. Her eyes burned with envious yearning as she launched into a hushed tirade. You've got to think more about this, Midori. The court has been accumulating power and riches for over a millennium and a half. We're not just talking gold. They've been trading influence across the globe, financing European banks and dynasties. Don't make too big a deal of it, I cautioned, sensing where her ambition led. Seriously. But Ashido was undeterred, leaning in conspiratorially. You really need to start playing smarter. Don't you see just by befriending her, we could change the trajectory of our entire lives. Look, the likelihood of me living up to 30 is evidently low, despite how certain individuals might disagree. If I somehow live to reach 100, there's a good chance I'll be the next thing to a power. I neither want nor need anyone's charity. You think you're gonna ascend to godhood too along with that evokers or foot soldiers in wars nobody wants. I'm talking about real things here. Money. Connections. Power. To become someone. I don't need a lot of money to be happy. I just need enough to do what I want. Ashido's gaze grew distant, weighted by melancholy self-reflection. How can you be content with just coasting by when there's so much more possibility out there? Clasping her shoulder, I met her storm-tossed stare levelly. Conversely, how can you be so unsatisfied when you already possess so much? She flinched, vulnerability furring across her features. You just won't get it, Midori. My entire life, I've had endless voices and pressures pushing me, forcing me in directions not of my choosing. For once, I want the power to make my own choices. Squeezing her shoulder in silent commiseration, I offered a reassuring smile. With great power comes great responsibility. Between us, it's Achako who bears the greatest burdens on her freedom. Ashido deflated at the mention of our friend's name. How can that possibly be, when she has so much privilege already? She abruptly gathered her bag, the spark of yearning banked for now. 
Whatever, I've got DGN1 now. Later. As she departed, I settled into a Wade Achako's arrival, ruminating on the yawning divides of power, status, and twisted societal pressures that threatened to swallow us whole from opposite directions. After awaiting Achako's arrival, we proceeded together to the basement chambers that served as our unorthodox classroom. Ashido and Professor Sarah were already present, an undercurrent of tension crackling between them like arcing electricity. Welcome, everyone, to this intimate special class on ceremonial magic, Sarah purred, unfazed by the charged atmosphere. Hello, Professor, I greeted politely as we crossed the threshold. How did the homework assignment work out? Izuku her eyes glinted with knowing mischief. I found theme opening, I replied, images of Achako's lithe, scantily clad form flashing through my mind's eye. Sarah's smile took on a sly cast. I bet. I truly hope you and Princess Pendragon had a stimulating experience together. Refusing to be baited, I met her gaze levelly. We did. With or without your assistance, Professor. Such lofty ambitions, she tissed with an arch of her brow. I wonder if you'll manage to live up to them. The door flew open, admitting a visibly enraged Nana. Hey, Izuku. This course, and Sarah. She's right there, I pointed out, nodding towards our unflappable instructor. Nana rounded on Sarah, utterly incensed. Good. This is a fecking stupid idea. If you're summoning anything today, I'm breaking that fecking containment circle myself, and ripping it apart as therapy. So much for subtlety. Sounds like the homework went well I asked dryly. Izuku, if you ever mention this godforsaken homework again, I will fecking hunt you down, break your kneecaps, and leave you to die in a ditch. Do you understand her menacing tone brooked no misinterpretation this was no idle threat. I held up a placating hand. I'm going to take that as a no. Chill, Nana. She's just trying to get under our skin. Don't let her win. Easy for you to say, she fumed, knuckles whitening. You weren't stuck in a room naked with that devious. Ah, so her rage stemmed from a self-inflicted humiliation. How predictable. Then perhaps wear some underwear next time. Nana's thunderous glare shifted as she noticed the intimate proximity between Achako and myself. What the why hell have you two been up to she punctuated the question with a snicker, mood swinging on a dime. Some of us managed our assignments without reducing the premises to cinders, I countered mildly. Oh, I haven't even begun burning shite yet. Just you wait. Turning to Achako, I explained with forced nonchalance. Turns out, neither of them believes in underwear. Achako, so their coursework ended up a little more intimate than originally planned. Achako's soft omi hung in the air, her reaction difficult to parse. Embarrassment titillation the mind boggled. In any case, that's the full roster present, I declared, redirecting the discussion. Let's see what fresh horror awaits us today, shall we? The tension in the room was palpable as Professor Sarah addressed the volatile situation with an air of world weariness. I will not be inviting any more of my clients to these classes. Poor Mr. Mistanak was deeply traumatized by the whole affair. Your terse response cut through the loaded silence like a blade. Good. Considering the horror you'd previously encountered with that particular entity's ilk, it was lucky restraint had prevailed thus far. Sarah's expression hardened as she launched into a didactic lecture. Look, Izuku. I understand evokers like yourself don't appreciate the intricacies of modern ceremonial magic. What you need to understand is its paramount importance to the broader magical community. You arched a skeptical brow. And why, pray tell, would that be? Because it vastly expands the pool of potential magic users, she proclaimed with the zeal of the converted. The old methods were all predicated on lines, even esoteric magic. With ceremonial magic's advent, anyone can wield power to heal, to extend their lives, to preserve eternal beauty. Your contempt was unvarnished. And all one must do is prostitute themselves to primordial horrors that would eagerly violate, and mind break you, given half a chance. A wistful look stole across Sarah's features. All I have to do is dance, tease a little and in return, I'm granted immortality. Trust me, it's a marked improvement over the old ways. Which were what, exactly you scoffed, sarcasm dripping. Throwing maidens at idyllic forest springs. Don't be deliberately obtuse, she chided. That's mere rhetorical fantasy. Of course it is. Sarah's expression grew distant as she delved into the history. Ceremonial magic as a power source has existed since time immemorial. Nodding towards Achako, you countered, somehow. The princess seems unaware of these ancient rites. A shadow passed over the professor's face. The court did not approve of the old practices. Merlin himself railed vehemently against them. Believe it or not, I find his stance difficult to disagree with the original methodologies where harsh, to put it mildly. The implications hung unspoken, an undercurrent of unease rippling through the chamber. Whatever reviled secrets lay buried in ceremonial magic stained origins, it was clear Sarah found the modern incarnation a merciful alternative no matter how ethically questionable. In what way I asked, my brow furrowing in confusion. We have had access to MM type of magic portals for almost 200 years, thanks to the revolutionary work of Isambard Kingdom Brunel. They changed the landscape of ceremonial magic forever, allowing it once again to be widely practiced across Western Europe, she explained. The name struck me as vaguely familiar, nagging at the back of my mind until it finally said, 
Isambard Kingdom Brunel the renowned Victorian polymath, an engineer and innovator with expertise spanning numerous fields, but I had never made the connection between his work and the arcane arts of magic before. The idea that this celebrated figure from centuries ago had ushered in magical advancements was baffling. What were the old ways of practicing ceremonial magic before Brunel's influence I inquired, equal parts curious and apprehensive about her answer. She paused for a moment, considering. Inviting someone or something out of the realm we call elsewhere, if you have the right location, utter the proper words and meet the requirements, isn't particularly difficult. The true challenge lies in compelling that entity to obey your will once summoned. And then, ensuring they depart when you wish it, which is often the trickier part. A chill ran down my spine at her matter-of-fact tone. And before these MM circles were introduced, how did ceremonial mages manage such summonings? Her expression grew grave. Usually, as I said, the old rites were far from an exact science for those unfortunate enough to end up on the wrong side of the summoning circle. Her words hung heavy in the air, and I realized with a sinking feeling that she was not jesting. Sick us. So, just to make sure I've got this straight, I said, trying to wrap my head around the unsettling revelation. People would basically tie up S inside a magic circle, summon a demon, let it have its way with her, and then pay for the privilege before leaving that's what actually happened. It's not always S, she replied, her tone tinged with a summer note. For instance, the Aztec rain god Tilalak had a preference for babies. But yes, essentially, it was a transaction of sorts. And the court managed to put an end to all that. At least in Eurasia, she affirmed, her eyes holding a fur of summer conviction. If you dare to attempt such a ritual within the hunt's jurisdiction, you'd be more likely to encounter a squadron of hunters emerging from the very portal you opened, rather than the intended entity. And what about other parts of the world I prodded further, curiosity tinged with a hint of dread. It varies, she explained patiently, her words measured as if navigating a minefield of complexities. Some societies have intricate systems of oaths and promises that bind both the mundane, and the otherworldly. But in other cases well, let's just say the deities people encounter often mirror the collective conscience of their worshippers, much like what transpired in Mesoamerica. What do you mean what happened there I interjected. My curiosity peaked. Despite rumors of a scarcity of mages in that region, I was still unclear on the specifics. When you water a god in, don't be surprised if elsewhere around you turns into a hostile landscape, she explained cryptically. So that's why there are so few mages over there I inferred, trying to connect the dots. Contrary to popular belief, there are some, she conceded, her tone hinting at the challenges they faced. But you'd have to journey quite far north to escape the looming influence of the Aslan Pantheon. Los Angeles is certainly not a place anyone sane would try to enter elsewhere from, she added, before smoothly transitioning to the day's lesson. Anyway, class. Today, let's delve into the economic ramifications of ceremonial magic on the magical community, with a focus on how it alters the supply chain. As the lecture unfolded, I found myself unexpectedly captivated despite my initial skepticism about the class. I couldn't deny there was valuable knowledge being imparted. And that concludes our lesson for today. Thank you all for attending, and a special thanks to Mr. Midoriya for not instigating any unplanned incidents this session, Sarah remarked dryly. Which reminds me, I'm still awaiting your write-up. I expect it on my desk this Friday afternoon. Her tone brooked no argument. Slinging my bag over my shoulder, I grinned at Achako. See, that wasn't so painful after all. A Achako I nudged her playfully. However, a mischievous glint danced in her eyes as she replied, I believe you're forgetting something, my dearest knight. Oh I arched an inquisitive brow. And for next class, here are your ceremonial magic practical assignments. Sarah announced, distributing sealed envelopes with the instructions. Curiosity over their contents had me intrigued for our next meeting already. Feck 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 Nana cursed vehemently in the corner, frustration evident. Just close your eyes and think of whiskey, Nana, I advised, knowing alcohol often calmed her temper. I, maybe a couple quick nips before homework wouldn't go awry, she agreed with a roguish grin. That's not quite what I mean to never mind. Just remember panties this time I chided with a smirk. As before, do not open these until prepared to complete the practicals. Do enjoy yourselves, Sarah added with a mischievous wink my way, to which I merely rolled my eyes. So Achako, shall we tackle this together like last time somehow I doubt the school library is the ideal setting, I suggested. The privacy of your room does seem preferable. After classes today she confirmed. After classes. Oh, radar scheduled heroics training how could I have forgotten? Works for me. Then it's a date, she said with a smile. One I'm quite looking forward to, I admitted, ignoring Ashido's whispered we can tell from across the room. After our ceremonial magic lessons, Achako, Ashido and I hurried back to the dorms to freshen up before heroics class. The day had been filled with engrossing magical theory and the rich history behind mystical practices. Stepping into our room, that familiar, comforting scent enveloped me like an old friend. We quickly freshened up then headed to combat training, pushing our bodies and minds through various scenarios to hone our skills. An announcement buzzed about the upcoming sports festival, though that's a story for another time. 
Afterwards, we made our way to Crowley. As I stepped inside, nerves twisted my stomach not for my own sake, but for Achako's. That's where my true concern lay. In the Crowley. So Achako, are you ready for this I asked, glancing at her with evident concern. No, I fear not. But we shall persevere, together, she replied determinedly, taking my hand and leaning into my side. Let's head up to the room and get started, I suggested, leading her towards the space Midnight Sensei had graciously lent me. By the way, Izuku, I've yet to see your private quarters, she remarked with a playful pout, lips quirking into a teasing smile. I chuckled nervously. I really should tidy up in there. It would be disastrous if you somehow gained entry and saw the chaos. I made a mental note to get my room in order soon. Tidy up, hum I wonder what secrets you could be hiding from me, she prodded mischievously. Oh, you got me. I've got a life-sized Achako body pillow stashed in there, I deadpanned. At first she seemed taken aback, but then peals of laughter escaped her. You are a terrible liar, Izuku. How did you know I asked curiously? Your expressions forever betray your intentions. It's one of the things I love about you, she said fondly before turning serious. But we'll need to work on that poker face if you're to survive court intrigues. Once in the room, we settled side beside on the bed. Achako handed me the envelope. You open it this time. I'm a little nervous, she admitted, fingers trembling slightly. How bad could it be let's see I carefully tore it open. Her eyes were fixed on me anxiously. I squeezed her hand reassuringly before reading aloud. Honesty and self-awareness are central to ceremonial magic. Really I'd have thought self-awareness was useless for whoring oneself to demons, she interjected skeptically. Hey, I didn't pen this, I chuckled, continuing to read. Today's exercise requires each of you ask and truthfully answer three intimate questions. That's all no absurd dress code this time relief tinged her voice. Well, there's a code. But I think we can do this outside once the moon rises, I said casually. Her face then turned pale. Oh no, please don't tell me it specifies dressed in moonlight. Yeah how'd you know? Then we are most definitely not doing this outside, she declared firmly, as if drawing a line in the sand. It's bad enough to fully undress for you, I don't wish for a wider audience, she explained, her cheeks flushing slightly. Hey, it said dressed in moonlight. If she wanted us to strip, she should have just said so, I protested, trying to lighten the mood with a touch of humor. Many of the most sacred fey rituals require the participants to attend dressed in nothing but the moonlight. Though I doubt they ever mix genders like this, Achako explained, her knowledge surprising me. Huh. I didn't know that, I admitted, intrigued by her insight into fey customs. Why do you care about fey rituals? Anyway I couldn't help but ask, curious about her connection to such specific knowledge. My mother was fey, remember I will not dishonor her memory by disrespecting her faith, she replied with a solemnity that made me realize the weight of her heritage. Do you think Sarah planned this that she knew about your mother I ventured, wondering if there was a deeper significance to the assignment? Undoubtedly. It was hardly a secret. I may as well get started she trailed off, her voice trailing off as she began to remove her shirt, revealing her white bra. Waiting will not make this easier. Okay, I said, feeling a mixture of surprise and anticipation as I watched her every move. If she was giving me a show, I wasn't about to waste it. And you, Izuku, she pointed at me, her expression a mix of amusement and challenge. Are you not getting undressed she asked, her tone teasing. Sorry, just enjoying the show. Don't mind me, I replied, unable to resist a playful retort. You are not making this any easier for me, Izuku, she protested, but the slight flush on her cheeks and the way she made no effort to cover up her body hinted at a different sentiment. No, but you're making it harder for me. I'm not sure standing up right now is a good idea, I admitted, feeling a surge of desire that I struggled to contain. What do you mean she asked, her curiosity evident. I guess you'll find out soon enough, I said, unable to resist the urge to tease her as I started to remove my shirt, exposing my upper body to her gaze. I think I can understand what you meant, last time, she said, referring to what I said on the last study date we had. There is beauty in watching you move, her face mixed with fascination and arousal. I've been stepping up my training since getting here. I need to get stronger if I am to survive as an evoker, I explained, the words coming out in a rush as I continued to undress, feeling her gaze on me intensify. She seemed flustered, unsure of where to look, and I couldn't help but feel a surge of satisfaction at her reaction. We are halfway, I guess. Who goes next? Achako asked, breaking the momentary silence. You, definitely, I replied with a playful grin. Letcher, she teased, her laughter filling the room. Oh, yes, I agreed, matching her playful tone with a smirk. Achako began to unstrap her bra, her movements hesitant yet determined. Okay, that that wasn't so bad, she said, her voice tinged with relief. You look gorgeous, I couldn't help but tell her, admiration evident in my voice. I fear they are inadequate. I overheard my chambermaid once, saying that men only like big s, she confessed, her insecurities laid bare. Some men, perhaps. Not me. I find yours absolutely perfect, I reassured her, my gaze lingering on her. The sight of her perfectly sized s, adorned with healthy pink nipples, sparked a flurry of desires in my mind, but I forced myself to keep them in check for now. And now, it's your turn, lecherous knight, she said playfully, her pout only adding to her charm. 
Okay, just you know, it's natural, with you getting undressed and everything, so don't freak out or anything. I found myself trying to explain, hoping to avoid any dramatic anime girl reactions. I began to remove my boxers, revealing my erect penis to her. What do you mean my is it supposed to stand up like that she exclaimed, her eyes widening in surprise. Depends on the situation. Don't say I didn't warn you, I replied, trying to maintain a casual demeanor despite the rising tension between us. I have never never seen a man's you know. It looks different than I imagined, Achako admitted, her voice filled with a mix of curiosity and uncertainty. Well, you can look all you want, once you've taken off your panties, I teased, trying to lighten the mood. So, yes, panties, she said, her voice tinged with nervousness. We could still do this outside if you prefer I teased her, enjoying her flustered reaction. No, I can do this. I just never imagined undressing like this before a man. At least not until I was married. You are not going to be overcome by insatiable lust and despoil me, right she asked, her vulnerability tugging at my heartstrings. I reassured her, trying to maintain my composure. Insatiable lust, probably. I'm not going to let myself be overcome by it, though. You will always be safe with me, I reassured her, hoping my words would ease her worries. And if I do not want to be safe she whispered under her breath, her words barely audible, but the underlying desire unmistakable. What do you mean I asked, curious about her cryptic statement. Oh, never mind. They are just clothes, Achako. Not armor, and not magical, she said, seemingly lost in her own thoughts as she removed the last bit of clothing she had left. Damn, she's beautiful. That's the spirit. It's not so bad, I told her, trying to encourage her. I am pretty certain it actually is that bad. I am standing here, naked before a strange man, like some shameless hussy, she lamented, her insecurities creeping back in. I don't think I've ever seen anyone else less shameless. In fact, if it was possible to die of shame, I'm pretty sure I'd be guilty of murder. I reassured her, trying to lighten the mood with a touch of humor. So just a hussy, then, she sighed. Just a girl. Relax, it's not the first time I've seen a naked girl. I told her, hoping to ease her discomfort. And that is supposed to make me feel better, she said with a pouty expression. Well, if it's any consolation, you're by far the prettiest girl I've ever seen naked. I told her, hoping to boost her confidence. Hardly. My s are too average, my hips too boyish, and an I'm babbling, she stopped herself before continuing, her self-doubt palpable. Horned Lord help me, she muttered. You've mentioned the Horned Lord before. Who is he? I asked, genuinely curious about her faith. Really we are doing faith theology now, she asked, a hint of amusement in her voice. I figured it might help you relax, I explained, hoping to delve deeper into her beliefs. I somehow doubt it will work. But to answer your question, the Horn Lord is the Lord of the Hunt, the Hunter himself, and the highest god of the Fae. My mother's faith, such as I know it, she explained, her voice taking on a reflective tone. I thought your father is the Lord of the Hunt I asked, puzzled by this contradiction. He would certainly like to think so. But the Hunt is older than the court, by far. In the absence of Cernunnos, humans have taken up the call. But we are only borrowing their title. It is not ours, she clarified, shedding light on her family's complex relationship with Fae traditions. Do you believe in him? I inquired, curious about her personal beliefs. That is a curious question. I believe he exists. He does not interact much with mortals, but the powers of the Fae swear allegiance to him. But what you meant is in a matter of faith, correct as in, religion she asked, seeking clarification. Yeah, I replied, eager to understand her perspective. Faith is a hard thing to nurture when your father hosts gods getting drunk at the dinner table. I do swear by him, but I do not pray to him. Or any other gods, for that matter, she answered. I've noticed that she's much more relaxed now compared to before. See, that helped, right I said, hoping our conversation had succeeded in easing her nerves. I guess so. But still, questions. As if this wasn't intimate enough, Achako remarked, a little bit of her discomfort still evident in her tone. I could ask you something innocent like what your first pet was I suggested, hoping to lighten the mood. She sighed. We have been over this before, Izuku. If I wanted to cheat on this assignment, I would have just done it while I still had my underwear. She paused before continuing. So, let us follow the instructions and ask intimate questions. I doubt I can be any more mortified than I am now. Are you sure I asked, wanting to ensure she was okay with proceeding? Ask your first question, Izuku, she replied, her voice resigned. All right then. I'm surprised you shave, I told her, observing her body closely. I couldn't help but notice the absence of hair in her pubic area and even on her legs. Now, it might be nothing unusual for a regular girl to have a shaved pussy, but this is the same girl who thought it was just a few weeks ago, so I found it odd. She only tilted her head in confusion before letting out a confused laugh. Did you expect me to have whiskers like a dwarf? See. No, I mean down there. You know, I awkwardly tried to explain. Ayumino, she seemed to have realized what I was talking about. Fei do not have body hair. Nor do Hafi. I had forgotten fully humans do, she explained. Usually, yeah, I told her. This time I'm feeling slightly embarrassed by my ignorance. She returned to looking insecure once again. I must look very strange to you, then. As if I was wandering around bald as an egg, she said, seeming to misunderstand something. No, not at all. A lot of girls shave, you know. Their legs and their armpits and well, I tried to explain. 
But we she simply tilted her head, looking at me as if I just told her the moon's made of cheese. Most men find it attractive. Why and obviously better for oral weight, no. Never mind, I said, dropping the matter. Oral what she asked, her confusion evident. I'm really not up for giving you a crash course in ed right now, ah Chaco. Shouldn't you have picked this up from the tutors I sighed, feeling a mix of frustration and bemusement. Yule education at the court is pretty much just a list of what not to do, she replied, a note of disappointment coloring her tone. Personally, the more I hear about it, the more it sounds like a dismal experience. Looks like I will have to use my first question. What exactly were you referring to with oral? Do they not teach you about the birds and the bees at the court? They teach young birds to keep their knees together around lecherous bees like you. Now stop wriggling, Izuku. Oral what her voice carried a hint of exasperation, as if her patience was wearing thin. Look, it's nothing serious. Just that clean shaven is a lot better for ing pussy. That's all, I answered her question. But we she repeated, her expression still a mix of confusion and incredulity. A full bush can be quite prickly, for lack of a better term. And nobody wants to be picking hair out of their teeth afterward, right? It's just not the most pleasant experience, I explained, hoping to shed some light on the matter. That's not exactly what I was asking. So, let me get this straight. You the, um, girl's vagina her gaze now held a mixture of bewilderment and mild horror. It was as if she were trying to comprehend an entirely alien concept. Given her keen interest in space, I couldn't help but wonder if she saw me as some sort of extraterrestrial being. Well, not just. It's more like you know, a combination of techniques. Sucking, nibbling, ing, using your tongue it's all about exploration, figuring out what feels good for her. I clarified, trying to ease her into the topic with a touch of humor. That does not sound very hygienic, she remarked, her tone tinged with concern. Don't worry, hygiene is definitely a priority. Just like with anything else, you'd clean up beforehand. Same thing as a blowjob. It's all about being considerate and respectful, I reassured her, hoping to ease her apprehension. And trust me, once everything's clean, it can actually taste quite nice. A little sweet, a little salty. So you've done this before oral, I mean she queried, still grappling with the unfamiliar terminology. And what exactly is a blowjob Jesus H. Christ? Come on, I did answer your initial question. I protested, feeling a bit on the spot. So a blowjob isn't considered oral she pressed, her curiosity getting the better of her. Well I hesitated, feeling a wave of awkwardness wash over me. Discussing Ed was definitely not my favorite topic. Um you still want an answer, huh? You still owe me an answer, Izuku. Somewhere along the way, I saw her teasing grin. You're enjoying this, aren't you? I accused her, trying to regain some semblance of control. He hey, you liked seeing me squirm while undressing. It's only fair that I get my turn, she retorted, her grin suggesting mischief. Hey, I still enjoy watching you squirm. It does fascinating things to your ass, I said as retaliation while zeroing in on her ass. Though I don't really need a reason to stare. Blowjob, Izuku she persisted, refusing to let the topic slide. Yes, please I replied with a smirk, but her response gave me pause. There was something unsettling about the way she smiled, as if it didn't quite reach her eyes. It sent a chill down my spine. Okay, okay. Don't give me that look. A blowjob is just when you, uh, suck a guys you know, I explained, feeling a bit uncomfortable under her scrutiny. And have you done this she pressed, her curiosity unyielding. Suck dick no. Sorry to spoil your fujoshi dreams, but I don't swing that way. I denied such a possibility. I feel like I need to hammer it home since some of the girls are already pairing me up with some of our classmates. Fujoshi what does that mean what I was asking was have you ever, you know, performed oral on a girl she clarified, her cheeks flushing with embarrassment this time. Oh, sure. Many times. There's something incredibly sensual about bringing a girl to the brink of ecstasy with just your mouth, I admitted, unable to conceal the smug grin that crept onto my face. So, the same mouth that ed me on our last date also pleasured another girl she exclaimed, her expression shifting to one of horror. I promise I brushed my teeth afterward. Besides, I never claimed to be a, I reassured her with a playful smirk before adding, do you regretting me now? No, never. It's just strange to imagine, she said, still trying to grasp the concept. Does everyone do this? Most couples, I suppose. It's considered safe, enjoyable, and pleasurable, I replied. What a curious idea. That all the girls at the university spend each day talking to me, then go home and use those same mouths on their boyfriend's penises, she mused, her thoughts still processing. It's kind of hot to think about, isn't it? Plus, when you consider it, it's a form of intimacy that doesn't necessarily entail losing your ID, I suggested, allowing the idea to linger in the air. No, Izuku, she responded firmly. No, what I prodded, sensing a hint of resistance. I can see the gears turning behind your eyes. And here you know she paused, choosing her words carefully, is reacting. You're having lecherous thoughts right now, she concluded, her observation astute. Guilty as charged. But let's table that for now, I said with a grin. I still have more questions for you. Then by all means, ask away, she replied, her curiosity piqued. Tell me about your first crush, I asked her, genuine curiosity lacing my words. A hint of surprise flitted across her features. How did you know I had one? Everyone has a first crush, I reasoned with a small smile. And they almost always make an endearing fool of themselves over that person. 
She replied with a wry quirk of her lips, well, I haven't made a fool of myself. Not yet, at least. Or so I'd like to believe. Trying to piece together her experiences, I inquired, how old are you again? Her brow furrowed slightly in puzzlement. 18, why? I pressed on, intrigued. So you've never fallen in love before never had a crush. A touch of sadness crept into her voice as she explained, life at the court, with its ageless beauty and hidden dangers, leaves little space for such things. My father's advisors walk a tightrope of respect and fear, and those of noble lineage watch for any sign of vulnerability. You build walls around your heart. She paused, her gaze settling on mine with quiet strength. While there have been others I felt a kinship with, I have always been wary. Until I met a reckless young evoker who risked everything for my sake. Surprise and satisfaction mingled in my tone. So, I'm your first crush. Perhaps I have little experience to compare it to. When I look at you, I feel a strange fluttering in my, as if my magic stirs in response. Sitting here, unveiled beside you, I feel shame, but also an exhilarating sort of anticipation. She paused, uncertainty in her voice. Even amidst the formalities of the court, a hidden part of me drifts back to you, remembering your face, the way your smile holds both kindness and a hint of mischief. So, perhaps it is a crush, or perhaps it is something else entirely. I don't really know what to say, I admitted, her candid revelation momentarily stealing my voice. Her voice, usually so strong, carried a newfound vulnerability as she confessed, you are the first man to desire me for who I truly am, beyond my title or connection to the Fey realm. And beyond that, a strange resonance resonates between us, as if our paths were intertwined long before we met. Achako, I'll do my best to live up to that, I said earnestly, bowing my head slightly in a gesture of respect. Seeking affirmation, she inquired, did I answer your question? Not the answer I was expecting, but one that makes me incredibly happy, I responded, a surge of joy washing over me. Noting her calm demeanor despite the heavy revelation, I observed, you seem okay with all this. I suspected you had known about it, she said simply. Casually ing strangers is not my thing, even if it is common practice in your realm. That night at the planetarium, gazing at constellations spun from starlight it held more significance for me than you might have realized. The scent of lavender incense mingled with the warmth of her skin as she fidgeted slightly. Overwhelmed by the depth of her feelings, I struggled to find the right response, finally just saying, should we keep going inwardly though, I knew I would need time to fully process this extraordinary turn of events. And what would be your final question for the day? Izuku she prompted, her expression open and curious. Thinking about the things I've learned about her, I think only one question comes to mind. It is risky, but as they say, fortune favors the bold. The scent of her shampoo, sweet and floral, lingered in the air as I leaned in slightly. Would you like to again? Her response is immediate, a barrage of incredulity that reverberates through the room. What naked alone in your bedroom are you insane she fires back, each question a pointed rejection of my audacious suggestion. Her cheeks flushed a delicate pink. But I don't back down. You didn't answer my question, I persist calmly. I did she rebuts after a momentary pause, her eyes darting nervously around the room. No, I clarify, holding her gaze steadily. You explain why it's not a good idea. What I asked was if you wanted to again. She utters my name, a soft murmur laden with uncertainty. Izuku. My resolve solidifies as I press, a touch of playfulness in my tone, this one's easy. Yes or no. Her eyes flit about the room, reminiscent of exam panic when the answer eludes you. Finally, tinged with longing, she concedes, yes. Aki eyes. I'd love to you again. Our last date was more wonderful than you know. But I'd rather not tempt fate by jumping onto your lap naked. Get decent if you want that. While firm in her refusal, a warmth tempers the rejection. I acquiesce, yeah, I should. Let me just think on why thoughts. Give me a sec. An awkward pause settles over us, broken only by the soft ticking of the clock on my nightstand. Lime warding. Poor Izuku. Looks painful. Want some help she offers, a glimmer of mischief dancing in her eyes. Achako I reply, her attempt to lighten the mood not going unnoticed, though my nerves remain taut. I still got questions, she reminds me, her tone lighter now, that one simple, though, it's a yes or no answer. Would I like you to help ya? Yeah, sure, I admit, a fur of hope mingling with resignation, but I'm not holding my breath. I will not use my mouth, if that's what you were hoping. But maybe maybe I could assist you with my hands, she suggested. I'm surprised with such development, but I certainly am not to complain. If you are sure then, yes. I would love a hand job. This erection has gone past painful and into excruciating, I told her. You poor man. Your girlfriend should take better care of you, she teased. Yes. Yes, she should, I powerfully replied, going along with what she's planning. How how do I do this, she said. Of course, someone like her wouldn't know the first thing about it. Just grasp it. And gently pump. The head is sensitive, so be careful, I said. For now, simply starting with simple instructions will be best. Don't want to overwhelm her or anything. We can work on something more advanced later on. Like this she asked as she grabs my cock with her warm little hands, where I'm reminded once again that she has incredible strength for her stretcher. Ouch I exclaimed. Okay, let's avoid the fate where my dick suffers the same fate as that dynamometer from the apprehension test. Not so hard. It's not a sword handle. 
For such a small woman, you've got a grip like a vice. Sorry, she says as she loosens the grip to a far more pleasurable pressure. Her eyes fixated on my member as if in hypnotic trance. It feels strangely alive. Like I can feel it pulsing in my hand, she said in equal parts excitement and wonder. I can tell by her short baited breath that the activity has already started to affect her as well as she pumps it up and down. Oh my god, I'm in heaven. There's a lot of pumping through it, I explained. Don't stop, that's amazing. You should see your face right now. You are almost going cross it, she said with an amused smile, though her face was red as a tomato, before turning back to my cock, it's getting bigger and harder. This is amazing, she whispered to my ear. So responsive. She leaned down, repositioning herself on all fours in front of me as she pushes me to lay down. Hall at sight of her face with upturned eyes just beside my cock as she tries her best to jerk me off is something else. I lovingly cup her cheeks as she leans onto my hand. This continued on for several minutes before I started to feel a familiar sensation. Ah Chaco I'm getting closer. Go a little faster, I told her. Her hands are moving clumsily, sure, but perhaps because of my horniness, or something else, the pleasure I'm getting is out of this world. Like this she immediately picked up the pace, leaning her face closer to mine. I always thought having was about a woman losing control. But here I am in total control. Ha ha I could you know, slow down a little, a teasing smile plastered across her face. You wouldn't dare, I said through gritted teeth, feeling like my nuts are ready to burst. No, I wouldn't, she said while letting out the most enchanting giggle I ever heard. Her voice a husky whisper, and she picked up the pace again. MMMHH, she asked excitedly, I can feel the flowing through your member, and see your desire written plainly in your face. She paused, continuing to pump my cock up and down, increasing the pace further. Are you getting close, she said, biting the edge of her lower lip. The superposing of the innocent Achako who barely knew what it was and the panting woman with the hungry expression in front of me right now has made me even more excited. Feeling the familiar sensation, I warned her. Ugh, I'm going to, at this rate, I'll be covering her body with my load. What do you mean she didn't get to finish her question before I couldn't hold it in anymore and let out my thick as I covered her ample s? Wow your stuff it's all over my, she said as she plays around with it whether intentional or not, spreading my further across her body. For a moment, she paused, looking at her fingers before locking eyes with me and sensually ed the off it. She's driving me crazy. But I know I should hold myself back. At least for now. Sorry, Achako. You were just too good. That's the best handjob I've ever had. I genuinely praised her. At least if you ignore the beginning. Well, then I just hope next time will be even better, she said, her voice a soft purr. Next time my question hung between us, a mix of surprise and a thrum of anticipation. This was fun. And I loved seeing your face as Yao climaxed. A playful smirk touched her lips. I will not have before marriage, but some harmless fun with my boyfriend who could blame me. You're rationalizing pretty hard there, you know that, right I teased, unable to resist tracing my finger along her jawline. Leave a girl some illusions. She swatted my hand away playfully, but her smile lingered. She headed towards the bathroom. When she re-emerged, freshly brushed teeth gleaming, a fur of a question crossed my mind. When did she put those in there? Lyman. I believe one question remains, she said after sitting in front of me. Her tone somber. It is of a serious nature, not anything salacious. She paused, glancing at their intertwined forms. Well, nothing overtly so, at least. Okay, I replied, unsure of where this was leading. Does it trouble you that we must keep our bond a secret, she asked, her voice carrying a melancholic weight. Wait, we must. She nods before answering. If my father finds I have acquired a boyfriend well, let us hope we can avoid that. At the very least, he would recall me back to the court and likely ban me from ever seeing you again, she told me. A leaden silence fell between them before I asked, and the worst case. Her expression turned extremely sad. Worst case would burially bad, she said heavily. I'm not blind to my father's flaws. He's capable of being prideful to a fault, and irrationally angry. The implication hung in the air. Okay, so don't let daddy dearest catch wind, or I might end up a hunted deer. Got it, I tried to lighten the mood a bit. But my question was, does it bother you she pressed, managing a poker face despite the worry lingering in her voice. Well, it beats the alternative, I answered frankly. But yeah, it stings a little. I'm sure people have their suspicions about us. And frankly, I'd bet everything I own that most of those suspicions are right on the money. But as long as neither of us confirms anything, it can just be dismissed as rumors. Still, there's an unpleasant feeling every time we have to brush it off and deny our feelings in front of others. I'm sorry, my dearest knight, she said, guilt weighing on her voice. Resting her head on my for a moment, she looked me in the eyes again. Twam not the easiest person to be with. All I can ask is that we make the most of our time together, and you don't think badly of me when I have to leave to do what I must. Well, I don't share your pessimism. Three years is a long time. Who knows what will change in that time, I reassured her. Three years is hardly enough time for a fledgling evoker to amass the power to challenge the world's powers. Izuku, she said, her expression serious. I know it pains evokers to hear this, but mortal flesh has limits. Even yours. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. Maybe we could just elope instead I offered with a roguish grin. 
Duty, my dearest knight, she reminded me gently. Did you know duty has become one of my least favorite words lately? Duty isn't about comfort. It's about doing what's right, no matter how difficult. Even when it feels wrong I challenged. Especially then, she said firmly. If duty only required doing what we wanted, it wouldn't be heavier than a mountain. I sighed. So what do we do now? Get dressed, I think. Our questions are answered, and modesty should be restored, she said with a wry smile. What a pity, I lamented playfully. Though I can hardly wait to see how our next rendezvous unfolds, she added, slipping her panties back on. It'll be amazing. We can handle anything together, I reassured her, an impish thought crossing my mind as I palmed a certain fabric. Indeed, she replied warmly, stepping into her skirt. Glancing around, she frowned. Have you seen my bra? I could have sworn I left it right here. Nope, haven't seen it. Let me help look, I fibbed casually. Strange, I'm certain I had it on the bed, she wondered aloud, my gaze roving over her partially undressed form appreciatively. Can I just say, you look insanely hot like that I blurted shamelessly. A playful smirk danced across her lips. More so than fully nude. Different kind of appeal, at least. Now, about that. After we're properly clothed, impatient man, she chided. While you're mostly dressed. Your innocence is safe, I countered roguishly. My chastity, however she began in mock protest, is already in tatters, as you said. What is a little more, I said as I entice her to the idea, looking at her subconsciously in her lip. I cajoled, holding her gaze as she unconsciously wet her lips. Ah, I seem to have found your missing bra, I announced, producing the garment from behind my back. Her eyes narrowed playfully. I had a feeling you had it all along. Perhaps, I admitted coyly, neither confirming nor denying. Now, I could keep it as a memento of our fantastic date I paused meaningfully, or trade it back for a. You are utterly incorrigible, she chided, though her body language betrayed her words as she stepped closer, barely registering the bra I dangled. Well, it seems I have no choice then. A coy smile played across her lips as she played along. You shall have your, so that I may get properly dressed. I responded with an exaggerated, melodramatic bow. Why thank you for your most generous patronage, fair maiden. She dissolved into a fit of laughter at my overacted antics. The musical peals of her mirth warmed my heart this remarkable woman's joy was a precious gift. Once she recovered, she looped her arms around my neck as I sat on the bed's edge. Instinctively, my hands found her ass, pulling her lithe form against me as our foreheads touched. Her intoxicating floral scent enveloped me as I drank in the sight of her sparkling eyes, flushed cheeks, and slightly parted lips. MMMMMMM she s as her soft lips touch mine. I couldn't help but give her ass a nice squeeze. She lets out a small yelp before pushing her body further to mine and tightening her hug. I can feel her soft, her beautiful erect nipples pressing against me. After a while, we parted from our, foreheads still touching. That that was exquisite, she breathed, gazing at me with unguarded affection, not retreating from our intimate embrace. I love the feeling of your bare skin against mine, I told her honestly. It's easy to forget your robust stature, she mused. Stronger than most knights, even without your magic. I could readily envision you in full armor, riding with the hunt. Perhaps we'll see that one day. You mentioned evokers do join the hunt. Perhaps but her countenance fell into that all too familiar pained expression whenever she envisioned our relationship's seeming inevitable doom. What is it? A melancholic sigh escaped her lips. By the time your powers have matured enough for that, all this will be naught but memory. I'll be another man's wife, forced to watch you ride off to war, hiding our cherished moments deep in my heart. Nonsense, I countered firmly. You'll be leading the hunt, with me ever by your side. And should Lord Jerkoff's sycophantic cousin's object, Nana will ensure they meet an unfortunate accident. I gave her a roguish grin. It's Yarko, she was unable to contain the chuckle from escaping her lips even as she corrected me. The ghost of a smile played across her lips. A nice dream. Nicer than the one that oft plagues my mind. Perhaps that unshakable optimism, that bold confidence your dreams will be realized, is part of your allure. Cupping her face tenderly, I met her gaze with conviction. I believe the choices we make sculpt our future's path. Just look at us could you have imagined this embrace a mere month ago? She shook her head slowly. No, exactly. So much can change in the span of a year, let alone three. The future remains unwritten. Her eyes shone with a glimmer of hope. I would dearly love to share that beautiful dream, at least for now. Pulling her close once more, I captured her lips in a searing as she melted against me with a contented. Finally breaking apart, I dear her cheek. Don't borrow troubles from a future that may never manifest. Live in this moment with me. A soft smile graced her features. Two will try, my heart. That's my girl, I murmured, claiming her lips once more. After our exchange and a few more lingering ease, we finally broke from our embrace. And no you've had your. May I have my bra back she asked with a coy smile. I was relieved to see her spirits had lifted. Sadly, yes. Here you go, I replied, handing her the borrowed garment. Thank you, Izuku. For the bra I quipped. She gave me a warm smile. No, for this. All of it. Sarah may think she's toying with us, but I'm happier here with you than I've been in years. Hey, if I'd known getting you partially undressed was all it took to make you happy, I'd have tried it sooner, I teased. Achako laughed lately. I think it was more the shared dream that did it. 
and maybe a little hope for a better future. But again, thank you, Izuku. Always happy to provide a little topless cheer. I winked. Before we knew it, darkness had fallen outside. Glancing around, I noticed many residents had already extinguished their lights for the night. It's getting late. We should head back before questions arise, Achako said pragmatically. I'm going to be working a bit later still, but I can walk you back to the dorms if you'd like. She shook her head. No need. It's just down the street. And Mustafu is incredibly safe compared to the paths. Besides she paused meaningfully, I need some time alone to think. I nodded in understanding. Okay, if you insist. This time, she cupped my face, she drew me into one final, soulful. Good night, my heart. Thank you for everything. Good night, Achako. Stay safe out there, I responded, cherishing her warmth before we parted ways. The walk back to homeroom felt normal, with Achako and Ishido chattering beside me. Most of our classmates were already buzzing when we arrived. Wonder who's teaching homeroom Hagakirisen piped up, her voice muffled by her invisible form. Before I could answer, the door slid open. Aizawa sensei stood there, not a single bandage on him. Good morning. Typical. Between recovery girl and at least one literal magical healer, a few days is all it takes to patch him up. Mr. Aizawa, your already healed shock rippled through the class. My injuries aren't important. More importantly, the fight's not yet over, he said, his tone grim. Fight Kakin muttered. Don't tell me, I thought as I ready both my cards and one for all. The villains again mind a whimpered, his eyes wide. Aizawa sensei's glare silenced our protests. The UA sports festival is coming. That's a super normal school event the class erupted in cheers, Kirishima almost bouncing out of his seat. Okay, maybe not entirely normal, but way better than another villain attack. Is it really okay to have a sports festival so soon after the break in Jirasen asked, her voice laced with concern. What if they attack again Ajirasen followed up, sounding worried. Apparently, Yue. S betting that holding the event shows how rock solid our security is, Aizawa sensei explained. Security will be tighter than ever. Besides, the sports festival is a huge opportunity. It can't be cancelled because of a few villains. I nodded to myself. True, plus some mages would be watching to scout potential recruits. Unless they wanted a death wish, or they're a god, attacking the festival would be insane. Even then there are some mortal mages I guess even gods would avoid. As I thought this, I looked back on the information I gathered regarding W. Booker, the evoker professor Andridi is temporarily substituting as. That guy was beyond dangerous. What a stupid reason it's just a sports festival. After all Mina whined from behind me. Mintakun, do you understand how important the sports festival is I asked, turning to face him. Of course but that's not what I mean he trembled in his seat, eyes wide. Our sports festival ranks among Japan's biggest events, Aizawa sensei's voice booms across the classroom. Remember, the Olympics were once the pinnacle of sport, captivating the entire country. For Japan now, that pinnacle is the UA. Sports festival. Exactly it's where we get scouted for sidekicks, Kaminari chirps, a gleam in his eye. Graduate, and boom, we're plugged right into the pro world. Jirasen snorts. For some of us, yeah. Others might end up permanent sidekicks. Like you, Kaminari. No offense, but let's be real. Kaminari's face crumples like a discarded napkin. His electric grin shorts are kidding into a pout. Aizawa sensei nods, his gaze sweeping the room. Of course, joining a famous agency brings experience, connections, everything a young hero needs. Images of Endeavor, with his blazing aura, or the effortlessly stylish best genus, flash through my mind. All Might comes to mind as well, but his agency famously doesn't take sidekicks. Going pro means opportunities open wide, Aizawa sensei continues, his voice taking on an intense edge. You get this chance once a year, three chances total. No aspiring hero can afford to waste them. If you understand the stakes, then prepare with everything you've got. Yes, sir the class roars back, the energy in the room crackling. Homeroom dismissed. After that, we went through our typical classes. English, math, etc. Midnight sensei's looking at me weird again. Lunch time. Ding dong ding dong. The lunch bell rings, and the classroom erupts with excitement. Kirishima pumps his fists, his friends fueling his hype. Chatter fills the air, a whirlwind of dreams about agencies and dazzling hero debuts. As we weave our way toward the cafeteria, a question that's been on my mind finally escapes. Achako, I've always wondered why did you want to become a hero? I know she was sent here until things cool back down in her homeland. But that doesn't need for her to be enrolled in a hero school. It's a bit of a story, she begins, a wry smile playing on her lips. When I was little, I wanted to earn money to help my parents. Our family business was struggling. My confusion must be showing, because she laughs. I can see the gears turning in your head. No, it doesn't add up, does it? Well I admit, a little sheepishly. Turns out, the father I knew wasn't my dad at all, but a face servant loyal to my mother. She'd made some powerful enemies and hid us on this plane for years. She pauses, then her gaze hardens. Once I learned my heritage, my goals shifted. It wasn't just about helping my family, it was about helping others, especially those hidden from the world of magic. I want to make a difference. Her smile returns, softer now, but filled with determination. 
My agency is going to be a start, but there's so much more to do. A wave of warmth washes over me. Is it possible to fall even harder in love that's incredible? I say, and it feels like an understatement. Flattery will get you places, my dearest knight, she teases, and her smile, the one that lights up my world it makes everything worth fighting for. Our impromptu lunch date is shattered when All Might himself swoops over, booming about a shared meal as if it were the most important mission on earth. One look at his face tells me this isn't some casual catch-up. We settle into his office. The air crackles with tension as he reveals the truth, his dwindling power, his approaching retirement, the rising darkness now that his light is fading. Then, those iconic blue eyes fix on me, carrying a weight heavier than any villain I've faced. It's a legacy he offers, the mantle of the symbol of peace. It's not a question of if, but how. But the world needs a symbol, and I won't let that need go unanswered. My answer comes, steadier this time, fueled by determination. Yes, it's a vow, a promise to myself as much as to him. The road ahead won't be easy, but I'm walking it, come what may. After classes, my excitement to finally spend some homework time with Achako practically fizzes beneath my skin. Then, a crowd outside our classroom bursts the bubble. Damn it now we're trapped mind to squawked at the onlookers. Why are you even here? Kakin shoved his way forward, eyes narrowed. Scouts, you little runt. The villain attack painted a target on our backs. They're sizing up the competition for the festival. Mina gaped at Kakin's typical tactlessness. That's just his way of saying hello, I explained with a shrug. There's no point pulling crap like that, Kakin growled. Out of my way, extras. I shot him a reproachful look. You really shouldn't call people extras just because you don't know them, Kakin. Not everyone is used to your brush manner. A disheveled figure with lifeless purple hair and dead fish eyes emerged from the throng. Aizawa sensei's secret love child, perhaps I heard Todoroki-kun muttering behind me. So this is the arrogance I've heard so much about, he grumbled. With all the hype around class A, I expected more. Disappointing. Kakin's glare could have melted tungsten. The crowd bristled, and I caught the briefest flash of unease in Achako's fixed smile. Her quiet anger was far more unsettling than Kakin's bluster. Some of us are biding our time in general studies, the insomniac continued. One standout performance at the festival, and those hero course slots could be ours. An interesting concept. My classmates may be an eccentric bunch, but their motivations were admirable. Not a fan of them getting the boot. But yeah, if you start slacking, I'll gladly knock your fancy party down a peg or two. Time to de-escalate before temperaments boiled over. No need for threats, I told him, meeting that listless gaze. Prove your worth on the field. We'll be ready. Sound good while he may have instigated, I aim to conclude on a sportsmanlike note. Unfortunately, the icy edge to Achako's smile suggested she had other plans. With a resigned sigh, I strode forward, the crowd instinctively parting before me. Achako fell into step, and we made our way to the Crowley, her smile still sharper than any blade. Time skip Crowley, late at night. I guess I should go have some shut-eye, I thought after a tiring day at work making my way onto the bed to end this day. My eyes burn, refusing to focus. Every inch of my body feels like it's being dipped in lava, then assaulted by a tsunami of cheap perfume. It's the worst sensory overload ever. Then, a voice cuts through the chaos, speaking directly into my mind. That's an exaggeration if I ever heard one, it said. It he the voice is masculine enough that I ruled out the possibility of being female. Unless there's a voice changer that works for telepathy. But then again, what limits the voice of someone using telepathy it's not like they're limited by their vocal cords. You can call me whatever you want, but would you mind freeing me at he demands. What do you mean free you from what I said while looking around the area, looking for this someone? You just have to pull me and you can free me, he said. You uh, dude. I've seen enough porn to know what you're talking about. Sorry, but I'm not going to be your stepbro, I said while trying to orient myself to my surroundings. Wait, the pain is shifting, growing stronger, morphing into a surge of power it crackles through my veins, whispering I could bend the world on a whim. Forget physics, I am the law now. What the hell are you on about the voice sounds confused. Just pull on me you'll be glad you did. I am Agad, I think, barely registering his words. Movement furs at the corner of my vision. A figure standing on a beach no, a sword rises from the stone, glinting in the impossible light. I point. You mean this? Yeah, that's me relief floods his telepathic tone. So, I'm dating King Arthur's great-granddaughter and dreaming of Excalibur. This day is shaping up to be a real winner. I try to yank the sword free, but it won't budge. Well, damn. Guess you're not the one, the sword sighs. Linked to mine, but still. Linked, huh so, I'm not worthy I ask, more out of annoyance than disappointment. It's not about worth. You're just not the king of England, he clarifies. I snort. Should I just quit nah? Something tugs at me, primal and insistent. I reach out, not to the sword, but to the power roaring within me. Like I said, it's not going to it what are you doing the sword's warning cuts off as I blast it with my newfound might. Then something bizarre happened. The sword becomes two, then four, then sixteen, two hundred fifty-six. Then tens of thousands of swords spin around me. Keep going I shout, ignoring the screaming pain. This power, it's mine to command. A cosmic bell tolls across the universe. Bong. Billions. Quintillions. There's no end. Yet, I won't stop. It's in here, somewhere. Bong crack. 
This time, a fracture appears in the sky after the bell, spreading across everything but I ignore it. There is a sword, blazing brighter than a star. I seize it, and its light bathes me in blinding radiance. Yet, I don't look away. The world reforms. A single sword in the stone gleams before me. It's as if nothing happened, the cracks mending faster than I thought, but I know better. This time, when I reach out, the sword slides free. Boom. And for one perfect moment, I am everything. Then nothing. Aaahhhhh I woke up from the nightmare. What in the world is that? Time skip to Thursday. My alarm buzzes and confusion fogs my brain until I remember. It's Thursday. Evoker class. A sigh escapes. At least it's not that insufferable ceremonial magic. I sigh while getting up. At least it's not ceremonial magic. I walk towards the class this early morning. The air is strangely stale. I drag myself towards class. The air feels strangely thick, almost stagnant. Where's Nana where's everyone I mumble. A forgotten memo some impromptu event doubtful. But then it hits me, a faint, muffled sound coming from DGN1, our designated dungeon. Those walls are built to contain chaos, so whatever's inside must be a spectacle. A grin spreads across my face. Thought summoning something, maybe additional spectators are always welcome, right my curiosity surges. Time to kill before class this promises to be a far more educational experience than any lecture. Let's check her I mean, this out. What? The? What greeted my was beyond my expectations. I see Ashidasen, naked, being held up a tentacun, a tentacled monster whose appendages resemble a certain male body part. While nowhere near as bad a defiler, these things don't use those to give you a manicure. And they smell awful they smelled worse than someone who hasn't bathed for two months. I guess ceremonial magic is a bit more involved than I thought. I've heard of the rituals and nothing I've heard describe. Getting the sentiment with their clients. But I guess you can't trust everything you hear, huh? 5000 MHMM Hamashidasen said with an overly enthusiastic tone as one of the appendages inserted itself into her mouth. Whoa, that does not look good. Guess I better lend a hand, I mutter. Before I can even think, her panicked scream pierces the air. Someone call Sarah a teacher help. Wrong department, Pinky, I quip under my breath. My pulse quickens, but not with fear. It's the familiar thrill of battle. Hey, Tentacleface, guess what's for dinner tonight, deal cards. My cards materialize, and a surge of one for all crackles through me. Crimson marks flare across my skin, an echo of the green lightning dancing around me. This is no time for flashy explosions, the dungeon walls won't take it. Plus, this isn't some deep elsewhere monstrosity. Time to get tactical. Two pair kinetic blades fur into existence, slicing the tentacles pinning Ashidasen. I bolt forward, enhanced by one for all, and scoop her up before the creature can react. You idiot that's not a human crook get help she yells. Understandable. If this is the peak of what she usually faces, it must seem terrifying. But I tune her out. It's on the attack. The tentacles whip towards me. I brace, the impact thundering through my arm like a freight train. Damn, that stings but it's exactly where I want it. Midori quit playing hero Ashidasen shrieks. We need a professor. Ceremonial magic bores me to tears. I reply, a grin splitting my face. Figured you deserved a demo of what an evoker's made of. Stop risking your life I don't want to see you die. Two pairs green lightning arcs from me, paralyzing the creature. With a burst of one for all, I launch a strike, sending it crashing against the far wall. Bam thud. Another card furs into my hand. No time to rest. Three of a kind icy magic lances pierce the monster, ending it. After a few moments, we're sure it was not standing back up, Ashidasen walked to me. Oh my gods, I can't believe you actually defeated that that thing. It's no problem, I replied with a nonchalant shrug. Ashidasen's eyes widened in disbelief. Why why didn't you just call a professor or something? The words you're looking for are thank in you, I countered with a wry smile. She released a shuddering breath. Shit. I knew something felt off. Deep down, I knew I should never have attempted that summoning ritual today. Well, next time those feelings arise, you'd be wise to heed them. Not funny, okay she reproached me. I'm not going to be yanked around by invisible strings like some puppet. Never again. Concern furrowed my brow as I studied her disheveled appearance. Are you certain you're alright I can call for medical assistance if you need it? Her gaze grew distant. No, it's just that creature. It nearly got me. But you're safe now, I assured her. Did it harm you? A rueful grimace tugged at her lips. It damn near dislocated my jaw. Rougher than that base captain back in high school. Apart from that brutish violation, you intervened before things went too far. Did it destroy your clothes I asked since she was still naked right in front of me. Not that I'm complaining, of course. A faint blush stained her cheeks as she registered my scrutiny. NNO, they're around here somewhere. I'll retrieve them shortly. She paused, studying me with newfound curiosity. That thing you wielded was that evoker magic I've witnessed it before at the USJ, but never up close. Allowing a roguish grin, I gave an exaggerated flourish. The swords of mankind, the monster hunters, and dragon slayers, at your service, fair maiden. I know my professors despite you guys, she said, arching one slender brow. But I've never seen power like that firsthand. The raw, unbridled foreseat was exhilarating. 
And you truly hunt beasts abominations like that tentacled creature. Yeah, we try to stop them from doing to others what that thing wanted to do to you. Are you sure this whole ceremonial magic thing is a good idea for you I asked, worried about what will happen to her in the future. A weary sigh slipped past her lips. And what alternatives do I have grow old at 40? A hideous crone by 80 she met my gaze, jaw set stubbornly. I wasn't born with an innate spark like you. If I want magic's gifts, I must work for them. It hardly needs to be so extreme, I countered gently. The vast majority lives out their natural lifespan without such power. Something akin to desperation flashed across her features. Well I don't want to resign myself to being one of that vast, mundane majority she shouted with unexpected vehemence. I will live forever, beautiful and ageless, no matter the cost. Sensing the futility of further argument, I relented with a nod. If you're certain you don't require medical treatment or want me to notify the staff recovery girl, perhaps. No, she shook her head firmly. I just need you to leave so I can redress properly. And Midori. I paused, arching an inquisitive brow. Yes, Ashidosan. Those vibrant eyes bored into mine, equal parts pleading and resolute. Please, don't tell anyone about this incident. Please. After a momentary pause, I incline my head. Of course. Just more cautious going forward, Ashidasan. Mina, just call me by my name. I'll also call you by yours, Izuku, she said. Sure. A relieved smile graced her lips. I will. Thank you, Izuku. I walked back out of the basement, walking down the hallways. That certainly is a weird moment, I thought. Though I have to say, Mina certainly is rocking a smoking body. As I emerged from the basement levels, I nearly collided with a familiar figure. Achako, unusually present at this early hour. Achako over here I called out, waving to grab her attention. She turned, eyeing my rumpled appearance with a furrowed brow. Hello, my dearest knight. Are you alright you look like you've been in a skirmish? Oh, it's nothing, I deflected with a casual wave of my hand. I just had to rescue Mina from a summoning gone wrong. Her expression hardened. What do you mean by that? Hoping to assuage her concern, I reassured, nothing to worry about, she's okay. Those warm brown eyes studied me intently. Essie, was there something you wished to ask of me? Seizing the opportunity, I ventured, yeah. Where are we going for our date tomorrow evening? A playful grin tugged at the corners of her mouth. Has it become such a regular occurrence that you don't even need to formally request my company first? I matched her teasing tone. Hey, a girlfriend has to go on a date with her boyfriend. It's practically mandatory. Poor, neglected boyfriend, she giggled. But yes, I would love to join you tomorrow. Wonderful. Where would you like to go? Achako tapped a finger against her lips as she pondered. Your choices have been splendid thus far. Why not surprise me again? An idea began forming, one I couldn't resist posing despite its audacity. All right, this is going to sound crazy, but we don't you show me somewhere you know better than me. Her brow arched quizzically. I fear there are few such places left in this world that exceed your familiarity. Exactly, I affirmed with an enigmatic smile. Which is why I've acquired access to a portal leading to the elsewhere realms. We could go on a date there, if you're all right with that see the vistas and experience the wonders you're so well versed in firsthand. She studied me as if searching for any hint of deception. A portal Izuku, where in this city could you possibly have procured such a thing? Midnight Sensei has one tucked away in the basements, I revealed. She's been sending me through on ingredient gathering excursions. That serious demeanor which I so rarely witnessed settled over her features. Izuku, I truly wish you would exercise more caution with the lures dangled by sorcerers. Dismissing her concerns with a casual shrug, I pressed, Oh come now, you'll be there to guide me. Just the two of us, no need for Nana, Itsuka, or Yui to chaperone. Achako's gaze turned inward, her internal struggle playing out in the subtle shifts of her expression. Two do not know. The court is beautiful beyond what you can fathom, but arriving with a human suitor would be complicated. Well it doesn't have to be the court specifically, I reassured quickly. Nana has a rather monofocused, murderous relationship with the paths. But I'm sure there are other breathtaking locales worth visiting, right? She seemed to mull this over before nodding slowly. No, the courts are not the sole marvel. There exists magic and beauty unmatched in this realm. Her eyes were focused on me with renewed determination. Very well then, let me play guide and you the pupil, just this once. I grinned eagerly. That sounds incredible. Tomorrow evening, then. Indeed, she confirmed with a faint smile. But for now, I'm afraid I must depart. I was on my way to lectures when I encountered you. Really I thought your other lectures were after the regular and heroics classes. Typically, yes. However, there has been a scheduling change to accommodate unforeseen commitments that will preoccupy one of the lecturers during the usual time slots. It could not be delayed further. I nodded in understanding. Got it. Take care, Achako. With one last lingering look, she turned and continued on her way, leaving me to ponder the possibilities that awaited in the elsewhere realms as I made my way to the lecture hall once again. After preparing our date for this afternoon, I waited for Achako at Crowley's. We've decided to take the date to elsewhere, for a change. Though the short walk to the bar usually feels lively, today it's edged with a hum of discord, like a note out of tune. 
People rush by, caught up in their own worlds, the golden afternoon sun casting long shadows. It mirrors the prickling unease just beneath my skin. Hi, Izuku. What are you up to midnight sensei asks, but her usual teasing tone is absent as she wipes down the bar. I was going to elsewhere with Achako, I say. The words feel oddly stiff. Issy, she murmurs. Don't worry too much about it, sensei. We'll both be fully dressed. In armor, I reassure her, attempting a playful grin. Perhaps. Be very careful, Izuku. I've had a blinding headache all day, and I finally think I know what's causing it. Her voice drops. You get headaches from your magic or from the booze last night trying to keep things light doesn't quite work. Both. But I can't remember drinking that much yesterday concern laces her tone. Often a problem in itself, I agree, but there's a hollow weight to the joke. Indeed. This though, feels like a migraine. Which tends to mean some sort of confluence. She frowns, then seems to shake herself. What's a confluence the question slips out? A gathering of power. A lot of power, in this case. I don't know if it's a new spell, or something old awakening. But I do know evokers attract these things like lightning rods. Midnight Sensei's voice held a sharp edge of worry. Probably just a student at the university preparing a ritual, I suggested, hoping to ease the tension. Just watch yourself. I don't want to have to housebreak another bouncer, she warned, a faint hint of amusement in her tone. Don't be silly, sensei. An evoker and a princess of the. What could possibly go wrong my attempt at humor felt forced. Don't make me count the ways, Izuku. Her reply was swift, leaving a lingering note of caution. Anyway, I'll be down by the portal getting set up. Let Achako know where I am, would you I change the subject, eager to move on. Going elsewhere with Achako promised a completely different dynamic from my missions with Nana or Itsuka. A thrill of anticipation ran through me. Greetings, my dearest knight. So, this is your little hideout Achako said, her voice cheerful as she descended the stairs. She wore her regular school uniform and a large backpack. Indeed. Welcome. I gestured towards the portal and her eyes widened as they took in the sight. The ancient stone archway hummed with barely contained energy, its intricate carvings shimmering faintly in the fading twilight. Its smooth, almost liquid-like surface rippled at the edges, blurring the lines between stone and something gother. A faint luminescence pulsed from its heart, hinting at a world beyond, a world of vibrant colors and impossible wonders. The very air vibrated, a whisper of the unknown on the breeze. This was where I came to earn extra money, but it felt almost sacred now. This is impressive, Izuku. I didn't know there was a full-sized portal this far into the city, she said, awe in her voice. You're not wearing your armor, I asked. I figured I should change here. We're technically not allowed to use hero costumes outside of official business. I take it that's the backpack is for. Yes, where can I change? Right here. A blush spreads across her cheeks. Ah, uh, but this is not a study date. Did you think I would just strip in front of you? Surely you've gotten comfortable undressing in front of me by now. A teasing grin tugs at my lips. Comfortable is a strong word. Let us say it is no longer mortifying, and even somewhat she trails off, and the fur of mischief in her eyes makes my heart skip a beat titillating. Titillating sounds promising. My voice lowers. How about we change here? Together. Her hesitation is barely a breath. I doubt the maiden ants of the court would find me undressing with a man to be a vast improvement over me undressing for a man, she says, but there's a smile playing at the corner of her mouth. Screw them, I reply, the words impulsive yet sincere. Well, someone should, perhaps. Thankfully, that is not my duty. A playful glint lights her eyes as she turns to her backpack. Shall we do this? I'm mostly joking. If you want, you can use the bathroom upstairs. Maybe I like feeling titillated the words are a soft challenge. And as she unbuttons her school shirt a thrill races through me. My eyes widen against my will. Ah my voice cracks, a pathetic squeak as my carefully crafted composure shatters. This is no longer the Achako I'm used to. And perhaps I enjoy that look on your face, she continues, her voice a playful purr as she slips off her skirt. The rustling of fabric echoes in the sudden silence. Every inch of her skin is radiant, and it takes all my willpower to rip my gaze away. In front of me is a goddess. Her inviting, alluring eyes look at me. Her fine curves from her shoulders going down to her and her hips that's just making me wanna grab is enough to make me think my armor's gonna be a tight fit for a while. Perhaps the bathroom would be better for you, after all, she murmurs. Maybe a cold shower would help you fit into that armor it's less a suggestion, more a dare. I'll manage, I think, I said, somehow squeezing myself into the Kamu armor. It felt tighter than usual. Militia armor. But then, you are very much a child of this world, she observed, a hint of amusement in her voice. And what about yours, I asked, desperate to change the subject. This S.H. Wardolf plate. Old. Very old. Made for my great grandmother, Guinevere. A wedding gift from one of the fey gods, she explained, a touch of pride in her tone. It looks gorgeous. Suits you, perfectly. Strong beautiful steel, yet regal and elegant. The compliment tumbled out before I could stop it. Thankfully, she seemed pleased. Flattery will get you far, my dearest knight. 
Shall we go? Sure, I said as we stepped into the portal. Looking around, the ever-changing nature of elsewhere is one of its primary characteristics. The beautiful chaos of the place gives its outworldly beauty. The ever-shifting landscape of elsewhere unfolded before us, a riot of impossible colors and shapes. Even after so many journeys over the years, my breath caught at the sheer beauty of it. I'm always struck by how this place never loses its wonder, I admitted. Indeed. I never grew tired of walking the paths either. If only there were a glade nearby, I could show you true magic, she said, a wistful note in her voice. You mentioned glades before. Are they permanent locations I asked, intrigued. Yes. The paths shift and change, sometimes even as you walk them. Glades anchor this chaos, granting us a place of stability in this realm, she explained. Think of them as islands of order in this sea of change. And the powers make these the concept was mind-bending. Mostly, they are human creations, fey and gods do not perceive reality as we do, and are far more comfortable carving out temporary spaces from the paths themselves than we are. So, the court is like that a human-made glade I asked. Yes, built by Merlin, as were almost half the glades we know of, she said, a touch of reverence in her voice. A busy fellow, indeed. That explains why I've never seen one, despite all my trips here, I mused. You said none are near Mustafu. No, Wade Achako's voice trailed off, her cheerful smile fading as her posture tensed, alertness replacing her previous ease. Did you sense that? I frowned, feeling defensive. I thought we already established that I'm blind as a bat when it comes to these mystical things. Even you should be able to feel that disturbance her words were sharp, eyes scanning our surroundings with a newfound urgency. An enchantment is unraveling around us. I'm not picking up on anything, I admitted. Maybe a slight ringing in my ear sent a strange pull towards that path on the left, but left her question was sharp, tinged with a new uncertainty. Straining my senses, I could only perceive a slight ringing in my ears and a strange, insistent pull toward the path veering left. I'm not picking up on much, Butya, there's something over that way. I pointed towards a shimmering, furring shape in the distance, like a disturbed pool's reflection, almost like a door of some kind. The structure looming before us defied comprehension with its sheer, imposing scale. Alien engravings pulsed with an unsettling rhythm, and the vast, arched entryway seemed to taunt us with its tantalizing promise of otherworldly realms. A gate Achako's voice trembled faintly with awe and trepidation. But that would mean a glade lies beyond. That's impossible, the nearest one should be all the way in Kyoto. Maybe someone built it recently I hazarded, grasping at frayed threads of logic. Izuku. She fixed me with a grave look. The workings of a glade are not some weekend hobby. They require immense power and effort, even by the standards of the gods themselves. In the entire history of the court, only half a dozen new ones have ever been created. She sounded strained, as if the mere idea was blasphemous. Only six in sixteen centuries the weight of potentially stumbling upon a Ancina Millennium discovery sent tendrils of curiosity entwining with dread through my pounding heart. Let's go check it out the rash words spilled out on a reckless surge of adrenaline before I could second-guess them. I can sense the trepidation in Achako's voice as she admitted, too I'm afraid. It is dangerous to meddle in the affairs of powers. You said your father is a power I countered, hoping to bolster her resolve. Yes, my dearest knight. And you would be well advised to not meddle in his affairs either, she warned me. But the magnetic lure of the impossible structure had already taken hold. But we should check it out do you really think it's just an accident that colossal thing materialized as we walked past I could feel my pulse thrumming with electric possibility. Achako's gaze remained transfixed on the ominous gate. The opposite, she murmured, barely above a whisper. I think this phenomenon was meant for us specifically. A tremor of trepidation laced her words. An anxious pause stretched between us before I asked the obvious question, though it tasted of ash on my tongue. So run. She shook her head slowly, a resolute fire banishing the fear from her eyes. No, if this is the path laid before us, fleeing will change nothing. Extending my hand, I affirmed, then we face it together, side by side. There's no challenge we can't overcome as partners. Ever the evoker, she managed a wry smile. I assure you, there is no shortage of the things in elsewhere that would make short work of two fledglings like us. My voice rang with defiant conviction. Then I choose to meet them standing tall, not cowering on my knees before the unknown. Very well. Achako stepped towards the looming gate, shoulders set. The door is sealed, but let me try something. She squared her stance, intoning with ceremonial clarity, open for the friends of the court. We held our breath, but the towering portal remained impassively shut. Didn't seem to do anything, I observed, trying to mask my disappointment. Would be too much to hope for, Achako sighed, shaking her head resignedly. That was the standard passcode for civilian glades constructed by Merlin. So you don't think this imposing gate is Merlin's work I asked, studying the intricate engravings more closely. Her brow furrowed pensively. I am injured. There are undeniable similarities in the craftsmanship and mystical resonance, but also notable deviations from his signature weave. Does that mean we're out of luck if you don't know the password? A look of fierce determination flashed across Achako's features. If no guardian forces bar our way, I can likely decipher and unravel the locking enchantments through trial and error. Unlike Merlin's most impregnable masterworks, this gate, while formidable, is merely difficult not utterly incomprehensible. I arched an eyebrow. 
I thought you counseled against meddling with such powers mere moments ago. A sly grin played across her lips. I am cautious by nature, not blinded by incuriosity. But having come this far, we will see it through to its conclusion. Fair enough, I conceded with a nod. Any idea what sort of trick or key might? My words caught in my throat as a disembodied, reverberating voice seemed to emanate from the gate itself. You need only ask, oh promised one. Huh. Achako's widened eyes met mine. I think I begin to see she turned back towards the gate, squaring her shoulders. Open up, please. Silence and stillness answered her command. She tried again, a tinge of desperation creeping into her tone. We come in peace. Open the gates. But the towering portal remained impassively barred, as inscrutable as the celestial mechanics that had seemingly birthed it into existence. Doesn't seem to do anything. Achako looked at me, confusion and trepidation mingling in her gaze. It addressed you as the promised one. Why you, Izuku you try giving the command to open. I felt a bead of sweat trickle down my neck as I stepped towards the gate's threshold. Um open the gates I half stated, half asked. The ground trembled beneath our feet as an ominous rumbling built to a thunderous crescendo. With glacial deliberation, the towering doors ground open, exposing a shimmering, abyssal portal. Achako fixed me with a searching look, wariness etched in the tight lines of her expression. It responds to you specifically. I like this even less now. What forces have you unwittingly brought into alignment around us? I could only shake my head, mouth agape, as I beheld the unfathomable cosmic mysteries beckoning us forward. I have no idea. But should we enter? Fools rush in where wise men fear to tread. So be it, let us delve into the depths of this inscrutable chasm, Achako said, a steely edge to her words belying the breathtaking vista before us. It's just a glade, I countered, trying to rationalize the beauty we'd stumbled upon. You mentioned they were relatively commonplace. Never common, she retorted, shaking her head adamantly. And this is no mere glade found on any conventional map. A crystalline lake glittered invitingly, cradled by vibrant, verdant trees. The air carried an ethereal freshness, utterly unlike the city's stale caress. It's beautiful, I breathed in reverence. The fragrance, the perfect temperature it's like an idyllic late summer's day. Achako's brow furrowed skeptically, and yet an ominous shiver snakes down my spine. Too feel I should recognize this place, yet the memory eludes me. My gaze landed on a slender, feminine silhouette approaching through the dreamlike foliage. Look, there's someone over there. Achako instantly tensed. Stay alert my instincts scream that something is very wrong. Trying to soothe her rising apprehension, I gestured reassuringly. Don't worry, it seems to be a single, solitary girl ambling our way. What danger could one person pose? Before I could counter her cynicism, the lithe figure drew near enough to fully assess. Welcome, O oh promised one. Welcome to my lake, she purred with a slight bow. Petite in stature yet radiating an unmistakable aura of power, emerald eyes glinted beneath raven tresses. Her delicate, freckled features only amplified an air of ethereal, youthful beauty. See I gestured toward the woman, giving Achako a pointed look. Perfectly friendly, but her demeanor shifted in an instant, eyes blazing with shocked recognition. To know you, the lake. You are the lady of the lake. Nimi the betrayer. Wait, what I said. How low the Pendragons have fallen, to have you as their last scion, she scoffed, ignoring me completely. Achako, what's happening my confusion mingled with a prickle of unease. And Izuku, I see your father's power in you. It is growing daily. Merlin's plan is coming together perfectly, she said. My father I asked, still unsure of who the hell he was. All in good time, Izuku, she purred, a condescending smirk playing on her lips. Another damn riddle. What plan my voice cracked with frustration. Soon, you will be strong enough to take up your throne, and receive the mantle, the woman said. What throne I asked? The throne in exile. But that will never happen, Achako seethed. The Pendragons protect Camelot. This usurper will never take our place. Right, I said. Foolish little Pendragon. Izuku is the true heir of Arthur. Your family are merely the groundskeepers, she said before mocking Achako further. And a terrible job you have done of it, too, she hissed, her disdain for Achako palpable. I glanced at Achako, her clenched fists betraying her fury. Be on your guard, Izuku. Nimi was a power in her own right, and no friend to my family, she cautioned me. My cards are ready, I said as I ready a three of a kind in case I'll need to make a distraction. Then, I'll use my cards along with one for all to grab Achako and get out of here. Fast. I expected her to conjure spells, but nothing happened. Instead, she stood there while clearly trying to hold back a laugh. I'm hardly going to attack you, Izuku. You're the final steps of a dance begun before Arthur's ancestors were even born, the work of many powers. Myself. Merlin. Your father authors, Nimu said cryptically which is starting to grind my gears as well. How was my father involved? All in good time. The mantle was Merlin's greatest creation, but even he needed help to power such a thing, she said. Who was my father? God's damn you my patience snapped, replaced by a burning need to know. Listen to me, Izuku. She thrives on chaos, twisting words and truths is her game. Achako pleaded. I know, Budimit, the secrets are suffocating me. I need to know, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. My father, my future eats a tangled mess, and I'm trapped in the middle. 
These are not my schemes, little Pendragon, Nimue scoffed. Merlin wove this tapestry, his hand guides the Winter King. Wait, the undead dog, it called me Winter Child. And a prophecy it warned me of. Winter Child prophecy Achako's eyes widened. What else haven't you told me, Izuku what's going on? It didn't seem important then I shot back, guilt twisting in my gut. In time, you will be the Winter King, Nimue's voice dripped with an ancient sort of satisfaction. The end, to Arthur's beginning. The king foretold, Nimue chanted. Achako, I swear, I know nothing of this. I think I believe you. And yet, I cannot dismiss this out of hand. Nimue is a power, she does not need to play mind games. Especially to us mere fledglings. Though she clearly enjoys them, she said. Together, we'll figure this out, I said, needing that to be true more than anything. What a simple-minded child. Did you truly think he was attracted to you, you plain-faced, stick-up-thieves tomboy? All this was planned before your great-grandfather was even born. She egged her on further. Achako, look at me. She's lying to you. I turned to Achako, desperation clawing at me. Did you really think Arthur would return or that Arek was someone worthy the future king will not be from Arthur's failed line? Merlin and I knew that. But even Merlin didn't expect your family to fall so low. She's twisting your thoughts, I insisted. Oh, am I? Izuku she then turns to me. Your connection to Achako is merely the magic within you, sensing the other half of the mantle. Through Achako, she gestured to her, and then the throne itself. Only when you take the throne will you reforge the mantle, and take up your destiny. That's bullshit. Some of Itekos with truth, Achako murmured, lost in thought. My family, powerful enchanters, yes, but none touched Arthur's strength. It's as if she looked at me, a chilling realization dawning. Whatever fueled him died with him. What are you saying I felt lost, adrift? It means nothing. My family has defended the court of 16 centuries, she looked straight onto Nimue, fierceness in her eyes, my mother gave her life to defend it. I will not give it up for this watery tart. Good, I said. And yet I cannot allow myself to be captured by some hostile glamour, she then turns to me with sad eyes, this, our dates it is too much, too fast. As if we're being rushed. How my mind raced, searching for sense in this madness. Perhaps a spell. Perhaps something native to you, and your powers. Or perhaps Nimue is indeed not lying. Or at least not completely. I need to know more. How do we do that I asked her. We do not. Achako's gaze was steady, heartbroken. Before I do anything, I need to clear my mind of your influence and seek aid with wiser mages than me. If this is a hostile spell, it came far too close to overcoming my defenses, she said. She keeps bringing up hostile spell, but I don't know what she's talking about. What hostile spell are you talking about? Her eyes looked even sadder than before, my feelings for you. My dreams of a future, together. If they are all just glamour, I must know. And just like that, my world tilted. Achako, I swear. Farewell, little Pendragon. Don't let us detain you. Run back to your doddering fools at the withered round table. Nimue's mockery stings like venom. Achako, please. My voice cracks. Desperation chokes me, I finally found the love of my life, only to have doubt ripped into her heart. She shakes her head, stepping back. I have my duty. To the court. To my father. I must leave, Izuku. Do not try to stop me. Her voice trembles as she turns toward the gate, into nothingness. Crep. The word hangs in the air, heavy with despair. Why did things turn out this way? Good riddance. I cannot stand that family, Nimue hisses. Why why did you do this I whirl toward her? She vanished in a blink, yet Nimue's cruel voice still echoes through the glade. Because you were never meant to be the mere consort to a failed queen. A storm is coming, and the court will need a real king if it is to survive. It will need the Winter King. It will need you. Well, that disastrous conclusion to what should have been a delightful evening left me utterly adrift. How could I possibly convince Achako that I harbored no designs on usurping her throne or even secure an opportunity to explain, given the fury blazing in her eyes? After that calamitous date, I trudged back to Crowley's in a daze, distantly aware of Midnight Sensei calling my name but unable to rouse from my anguished stupor. I need a drink. Lots of them, I muttered, the words tasting of ashes on my tongue. Thankfully, we're in a bar. I'll go snag a bottle or thirty. I'm not really feeling sociable right now. Deep down, I knew inebriation would do little to salve these fresh wounds. But perhaps it could at least deliver the fleeting mercy of an alcohol-induced slumber. I proceeded to drown my sorrows until finally stumbling up to bed in a dizzy haze. Some indeterminable time later, the chirping of birds and the harsh rays of late morning light pierced the veil of my drunken oblivion. Good morning, Izuku. Rise and shine, Midnight Sensei greeted with an impish grin. I tried to rise, but the room spinning violently as a sledgehammer pounded my skull was her only answer. Erg I groaned, likely resembling one of the mindless undead from a bargain bin video game. I must say, I'm quite impressed by your dedication to drinking yourself into a stupor last night, she quipped. I don't think I've ever witnessed an evoker crippled by a hangover. I croaked miserably. What what did I even drink? Sensei arched an eyebrow. It might be quicker to ask what you didn't, considering the state you're in. But judging by your condition, I assume your little romantic rendezvous with Achako didn't go according to plan. I winced, partially from the stabbing pain, mostly from the raw memories. She hates me now. Probably justifiably so. Do tell what fresh catastrophe did you unleash this time. 
Drawing a ragged breath, I began recounting the previous night's events. We found something. A glade, not far from here. Midnight Sensei's brow furrowed skeptically. There shouldn't be any glades in this vicinity. I can only assume this was the confluence event I sensed brewing yesterday. I think so, I rasped. We discovered a lake. And a woman. Nimu. She exhaled a low whistle. That is a name I haven't heard uttered in ages. So the lady of the lake herself has resurfaced. That is unfortunate news, to say the least. She convinced Achako that I was somehow born to usurp her throne. Her birthright. I shook my head in exasperation. I barely understand half of what's going on. I can certainly see how such claims would land you in hot water, Sensei replied dryly. But what specifically did this Nimue allege? She said I was destined for this. The result of some grand prophecy. That the only reason I was drawn to Achako at all was because off the mantle. At the utterance of that peculiar word, Midnight Sensei's expression shifted subtly, her casual demeanor evaporating like a dawn mist before the rising sun. Sensei I prompted warily. You're absolutely certain she used that precise term mantle she pressed, suddenly laser-focused. Yeah, she claimed the mantle would be completed once I was crowned king. Called it Merlin's greatest creation. Sensei's eyes widened fractionally before she exhaled a loaded curse. Well, that's not ominous in the slightest, given some of the other monstrosities that old goat Merlin unleashed upon the world. A tense pause stretched between us before she shook her head grimly. Shit thighs is terrible. Yeah, Achako was absolutely livid, I said, my voice tinged with dejected resignation. I doubt she'll ever be willing to speak to me again after this. Midnight Sensei let out an exasperated sigh before fixing me with a level gaze. For the moment, set aside your concerns about the girl. Think bigger picture here. The wreck will not simply step aside because Nimue issued some proclamation. There is a deep, bitter enmity between the Lady of the Lake and the Pendragon lineage. I nodded slowly, recalling the scathing, venomous barbs Nimue had flung at Achako with caustic glee. Yeah, I definitely noticed the animosity between them. If word of this supposed prophecy reaches Arek's ears, you are as good as dead, Sensei stated bluntly. And that's leaving aside any other powers who would undoubtedly take issue with you potentially claiming this mantle. What the hell is a mantle, anyway? My brow furrowed in confusion. Okay, but what the hell is this mantle thing anyway? She paused, seeming to carefully weigh her words. It is the crucible from which gods are forged, a socket in the very fabric of reality where power converges, and an immortal essence can take shape. The god of war. The lord of the hunter eyes bored into mine with sudden intensity. The once and future king. A dawning look of realization played across her features as the pieces fell into place. Oh shit. What I asked, thoroughly bewildered by this escalating turn. The once and future king, she repeated, shaking her head slowly. The wreck, nor any Pendragon since, was ever a true match for Arthur himself. Because that particular mantle was never intended for them it was solely crafted for Arthur and now, for you. My mind reeled as I struggled to process this revelation. So hat, you're saying I could become a god is that a bad thing I snorted mirthlessly. I mean, sure, Erek seems keen to kill me over it, and Achako undoubtedly despises me now, but... You're missing the bigger picture here, Sensei cut me off. Merlin never did anything without deliberate, calculated reason. Sixteen centuries ago, he constructed an entire fortress realm and elsewhere, and imbued its king with power eclipsing that of many gods. And then what happened I asked, morbidly curious. And then he perished, along with Arthur and most of the legendary knights of his round table, she replied grimly. All I know is that they fell in a cataclysmic battle. But against what foe that is the crucial question we need to unravel. I know this. Something began nagging at the back of my aching mind. Why is that so important, though? Merlin was a greater power, Sensei explained with weary patience. And Arthur, as you now know, was essentially a god. Many of the companions were powers in their own right. So what killed them all that may be the answer you need to resolve, she said. The other gods. I doubt they could have succeeded. Not without it basically being a divine extinction event. No, whatever vanquished them I guess that it came from outside the established realms entirely. But still, we need more concrete answers first. Realization struck me like a thunderbolt. You seem far more unsettled by the implications of what killed Merlin and Arthur than by the fact Erek apparently wants me dead now. A grim chuckle escaped her lips. Erek is a mere mortal annoyance one I can deal with. But Merlin created Arthur specifically to combat whatever unfathomable force they faced 16 centuries ago. Her eyes bored into mine with dire intensity. Which raises the terrifying question, why did he create you? My head still pounding, I could only fumble out the first inane thought that sprang to mind with a helpless shrug. To become the king of Camelot again, if Nimue's ravings are to be believed. Midnight Sensei fixed me with a sardonic look. Don't be dense, Izuku. Merlin didn't elevate Arthur to such lofty heights out of mere altruism. He needed an unconventional human weapon, and the mantle of the once and future king provided the catalyst for channeling raw, divine power. If that's truly what we're grappling with here, we have to operate under the assumption that whatever cataclysmic force is looming requires an equivalently mighty hammer to counter it. 
Okay, so what's our plan of action then I asked. She let out a mirthless chuckle. Under normal circumstances, I'd advise cutting your losses and running as far as you can from this whole apocalyptic prophecy mess. But if we're facing down a threat potent enough to wipe out entire pantheons of powers, I'm not convinced there exists any corner of reality remote enough to escape its grasp. A wry smirk played across her lips. Unless you happen to have connections at SpaceX, that is. Probably. I shook my head, crestfallen. So you've got nothing then no strategy for how to proceed. For now, I need to dedicate myself to researching and uncovering more concrete answers about what we're up against, she replied, expression turning pensive. In the meantime, you've got more immediate, pressing concerns to wrestle with. If your disgruntled little girlfriend informs her father Iraq about these world-shaking prophecies, you'll likely end up dead long before Merlin's grand plans ever reach fruition. Running a hand through my tousled hair, I sighed heavily. I guess I'll find out if she spilled the beans when classes resume on Monday. Maybe I should have asked for her number I quickly scrolled through my contacts, foolishly hoping her digits might materialize, but of course the list remained frustratingly incomplete. Ah well, assuming there's even cell service in the depths of elsewhere to begin with. Midnight Sensei rose from her seat, a concerned crease forming between her brows. There isn't. But no matter what, above all else stay vigilant and focus on growing stronger, Izuku. We've only just getting started. I nodded, a hard knot of determination forming in my as I pushed aside the tumultuous night's events. Got it. I'll be ready, whatever comes next. Bye, for now, sensei. With that, I made my way to the basement, my hangover miraculously fading. For the foreseeable future, becoming overwhelmingly powerful was my sole priority. No more distractions it was time to get seriously strong. Three days had passed without Achako returning to the dorms, and a knot of worry twisted in my stomach. Would she ever come back I sat on the bench near the school gates, trying to pass the time. For the last few days, I'd been immersing myself in the world of elsewhere as much as possible, determined to grow stronger. Itsuka, Nana, and Yui had been by my side, and a sense of camaraderie had blossomed between us as we hunted monsters together. I'd also exacted my revenge on the high-level fire elemental that had burned me a week before the start of the school year. After a few minutes, I realized it was time for ceremonial magic class. Maybe, by some miracle, Achako would attend despite our feud, giving us a chance to make amends. I let out a deep sigh before catching sight of Mina heading to class. I guess I should go with her. Hey, Mina, I greeted her, falling into step beside her. Oh. Hi, Izuku her face brightened as she closed the distance between us. I'd vowed to avoid distractions, but the scent of her hair made my heart race despite my best efforts to steer my thoughts elsewhere. How did the course you go I asked, recalling her fury at Nana the last time. Today, she seemed calmer. What course you she blinked at me. Oh, that stupid thug never showed up. Not my problem. She looped her arm through mine. You haven't seen Achako around, have you? I tried to keep my tone casual, though hope furred within me. No, not really. But I'm sure she'll be in class, Mina said with a reassuring smile. Yeah, I was hoping to meet up with her before that but never mind. Let's go. Pushing my worries aside, I walked with Mina toward DGN1 and took our seat. Welcome to this session of ceremonial magic. Before we start, I have some housekeeping matters to address. Sarah said, pausing meaningfully. Princess Pendragon will be absent today, having returned to the court on official business. Gods. Damn. It. I muttered under my breath, hopes dashed. She has also requested a change in coursework assignments, Sarah continued. Izuku, I believe that means you'll now be paired with Let Me See Nana. What I blurted out, caught off guard. Actually, Dr. Sarah, if I may. Mina, who was sitting beside me for some inexplicable reason, interjected. I believe Izuku and I would make an excellent partnership. I leaned toward her, whispering urgently, what are you playing at here? Trust me. I know what I'm doing, she whispered back with a conspiratorial gleam in her eye. What the is going on I hissed, thoroughly confused. Oh, Miss Ishido you would rather partner with Izuku than Miss Pendragon Sarah asked, surprised she would forfeit the opportunity. Very well, if you insist. I thought you were all about finding a connection to the throne and using it to get rich I questioned Mina, perplexed by her uncharacteristic actions. Later, she deflected. I'll explain later. I sighed heavily. You'd better. Without missing a beat, Sarah launched into the lecture. Apart from that, today we will discuss the logic underpinning the magical membrane circles, and how it differentiates from normal summoning circles. Actually, so long as you don't consider her area of expertise, she's a very good teacher. I found myself learning quite a lot over the next hour. And that's all for today. Thank you for attending, and I'll see you next week, Sarah concluded as students began gathering their belongings. As always, your homework assignments are in the envelopes at your desks. I retrieved the envelope, turning my attention to Mina. Okay, spill it. What the hell is going on? I'll tell you when we do the assignment, she replied, her expression grave. Displeased with her antics but unwilling to cause a scene as the students start going to their respective classes, I merely sighed as the classroom emptied. Okay, how about coming over to the bar I work at later there's a private room upstairs we can use, I suggested. Mina's face flushed crimson. Wah wait no, that's too early she flashed a mischievous grin. Let's just do it here in DGN1. 
I'll book the lecture theater. See you without awaiting a response, she dashed off to homeroom. Why yeah I managed weekly, still utterly baffled by her peculiar behavior. After school, Mina's absence for the latter part of the day left me unsettled. Where had she disappeared to I tried telling myself that as long as she wasn't getting into trouble, it didn't matter. Even so, a nagging disquiet persisted. My thoughts inevitably drifted to Achako's continued absence as well. We were supposed to be tackling this together. With a dejected sigh, I made my way to DGN1. How the hell did my life go so wrong, so quickly? As I made my way there, I noticed the lack of muffled sounds of struggle. I guess it's too much to hope for it'll at least be more entertaining. I, of course, she's not here. The empty room mirrored the blank canvas of my disappointment. After nearly an hour of solitary waiting, Mina finally burst through the door. Hi, Izuku thanks for waiting she flung her arms around me in an exuberant hug. I've been here for almost an hour, I stated flatly. You had better have a good explanation. At least she had the decency to look somewhat abashed. W.L., I was having lunch with the personal assistant to the deputy vice chancellor. She had these really interesting stories about pushing for more non-magic studies in our curriculum. Before I knew it, I was running late. She offered a nervous giggle. Smothering another sigh, I refocused on the heart of the matter. I don't even want to know about that. Why did you drag me into this why are we suddenly study buddies? It's not important, she deflected once more. I just needed an excuse to get you here. The homework provided one. Her cryptic response only deepened my bewilderment. Okay I eyed her warily. Let's just get this over with. I'll open the assignment envelope. I retrieved it from my bag. What do you think you're doing Mina's brow furrowed in confusion. Reading our assignment I replied slowly, as if explaining something to a child. Flexibility is at the heart of ceremonial magic. Today's assignment will lead you through a sequence of traditional poses used by practitioners of ceremonial magic. Mina snatched it from my hands, scanning the contents herself. Oh, it's just basic poses. Bend and spread, legs behind your head, nude handstand splits. Boring stuff. She carelessly tossed the letter aside. My mind immediately conjured vivid images of Achako contorting herself into those suggestive positions. Heat rushed to my face as arousal stirred within me, only to be dashed by the harsh reality of her absence. What's with that look Mina's voice snapped me back to the present. Swallowing hard, I admitted, my mind is simply trying to process the idea of Achako doing a nude handstand split for me. Look, I looked into things with Achako, some are thinking that you assaulted her, Mina said, her tone rebuking and a tinge of disbelief. I recoiled as if struck. What the hell are you talking about I never did that. Like, Sarah totally thinks so as well. Little Miss Duty and Honor suddenly running away and refusing to be in the same room as you it sends the wrong message. It's nothing like that. At all, I insisted, disgust roiling in my gut. It's just politics. Are you kidding she said, surprised. What kind of political entanglements could you possibly have with someone like her? Grinding my teeth, I fought to rein in my temper. Whatever. Let's just get this over with. We're not doing the assignment, Mina stated flatly. I blinked in surprise. Look, I know Sarah's assignments are embarrassing, but we still have to complete them. What dude, it's nothing like that. I've been practicing ceremonial magic for years. I could do those poses in my sleep. She jerked her chin toward the center of the room. Now, go sit on that chair. My gaze followed hers to the ornately carved chair situated within an intricately inscribed circle on the floor. The chair inside the summoning circle. Yes, the chair inside the summoning circle that links our world to a place where unspeakable and horny things wait to and mind break anyone they can get their hands on I clarified once more. Yes, absolutely not happening, I said flatly, turning on my heel. Don't get scared now Mina called after me. I promise I won't open the portal. I just need you to sit inside the circle. Not happening. If we're not doing the assignment, I've got better things to do. I'll see you later, I said making my way to the stairs. Hopefully, someone's free to go explore elsewhere together at this hour. Look, Izuku, I need your help her voice cracked with the glimmer of unshed tears. I hesitated despite my better judgment, turning back to face her. Don't go please. I need you to help me. Otherwise, something terrible will happen. I know it will. Mina's expression was utterly earnest, devoid of her usual playful bravado. A heavy sigh gusted from my lips as I warred with indecision. I can't believe I'm even considering this. What do you need my help with? A fur of hope brightened her eyes. You remember that thing with the tentacles. How could I forget? When I saved you from being deed to death by the creature you'd summoned I asked, recalling the harrowing incident. Yes, that. Mina averted her gaze, shame tinging her cheeks. Well, afterwards I haven't been able to use my magic. Every time I try, I freeze up. Understanding dawned. The traumatic experience had given her PTSD-like symptoms. Logic dictated she should seek counseling from Hound Dogs and say, not me. I need you to help me fix it, she pleaded. I recoiled at the implication. You want me to be your bodyguard while you can wear yourself out to tentacle monsters revulsion churned in my gut. Yeah, that's not happening. No, nothing like that she backpedaled quickly. I just have this feeling that if I practice on you, I'll be able to get over this. I arched a skeptical brow. So you want me to be a defiler stunt double a disgusted grimace twisted my features. That's not insulting or anything. No, you're scary but not really dangerous, Mina insisted. I just know this will work. Please I'm desperate. 
I'll do anything to get my magic back. Desperation tinged her voice, her eyes shining with unshed tears. Against my better judgment, I felt a fur of sympathy. With a resigned sigh, I moved toward the ominous chair. I just know I'm going to regret this. And if you try to open that portal while I'm inside, we're going to have words afterward. Do you understand? Mina's face brightened with relief and gratitude. Oh thank you, thank you so much you have no idea how much this means to me. Whatever, let's just get this over with. No sooner were the words out of my mouth than Mina began undressing. What are you doing I sputtered. Getting undressed Mina cocked her head innocently. It's supposed to be ceremonial magic. You can't really do that properly dressed. Well, maybe some lingerie sometimes, or with toys involved. But I didn't bring anything like that today. I sputtered, flushing at her casual nudity. You know what I give up. I'm just going to sit here and enjoy the show. Gloriously bare before me, Mina flashed a mischievous smile. Do you like what you see? I drank in the sight of her lithe form. Very nice, I managed. Much better than the princess, right she hovered enticingly close, her pert ass nearly brushing my nose. Swallowing hard, I rasped, not exactly. But since you're enjoying this, why don't you turn around for me? Mina obliged, bending at the waist to afforded me an eyeful of her toned backside. I couldn't tear my gaze away as she parted herself shamelessly. Like this. An unsettling sensation prickled at the edges of my awareness a subtle tugging at my magic, as if forming a conduit through the circle itself. Unease furred within me at the realization that I was experiencing sensations more befitting a lesser being. Mina's throaty murmur snapped me back to the present. Do you like my ass, Izuku are you fantasizing about me there about sliding your big, hard cock into my tight little asshole? My eyes bored into her brazenly displayed cleft as she lewdly writhed and spread herself wider. Sweat beaded on my brow as arousal thrummed through my veins, despite my discomfort. I'm starting to see the attraction of ceremonial magic. I managed a roguish grin, from this angle at least. That unsettling pull grew stronger, but I stubbornly shunted it aside, fixating on Mina's tantalizing form. Don't tell me my tits aren't better than Achako's, she taunted breathily. They're magical. I let my gaze roam shamelessly over her modest but entrancing curves. They do look good. Certainly unique. I'd have to touch them to be sure, though. The strange tugging became a distracting throb in the back of my mind as Mina dropped to her knees. She fondled her ass shamelessly, pebbled nipples straining against her palms as she splayed herself further. Do you see my pussy? Her words dripped with sin as she shamelessly displayed her glistening folds. My wet, pussy wouldn't you want to be the first to it to feel your cock break my hymen and spill your deep inside me? You really are a tease, do you know that I remarked dryly, though my pulse quickened as I drank in her shameless display. That unsettling tugging became insistent, distractingly so despite the alluring view before me. Experimentally, I channeled a trickle of magic through our mystical tether, playing a simple pair. Mina shuddered violently, yet managed to remain upright as she gaped at me in disbelief. Holy shit. That was amazing, she rasped, voice thick with a strange reverence. I arched an inquisitive brow. If you say so. What the hell just happened? It's like you paid through the circle. Except a thousand times better, she said. I feel like I'm full of magic, I've never received that much before. And it tastes so nice, she said as if still entranced by the feeling. Tastes I echoed skeptically. That's an odd way to describe magic. Yeah, like most customers magic holds a hint of bitterness. She grimaced faintly. But yours was something else entirely. Like drinking the finest champagne after only knowing stagnant water my whole life. I mauled over her peculiar explanation. Does this always happen with evokers, or something? Mina shrugged, seeming dazed. I don't know. Evokers and ceremonial magicians rarely see eye to eye on these matters. Maybe nobody's tried this before she squirmed, features flushed. God, that was incredible. It makes me want to. Wanda what I prodded when she trailed off. Lime warding. Would you help me her gaze smoldered with naked need. Please say yes. I'm going to play with myself. When I tell you, can you do that again? Interest peaked despite myself, I agreed. Oh, if you insist. That first jolt was almost enough. Let me just get comfortable, Mina purred, reclining shamelessly onto the floor. I felt emboldened to mirror her state of undress. I'm going to get comfortable as well. Her eyes shamelessly raked over my bared form as I divested myself of restrictive clothing. Feel free. Won't be the first time. Reassured by her nonchalance, I turned my attention to where Mina had begun languidly pleasuring herself. She mewled softly, hips undulating in time with her ministrations. Oh, that feels incredible. I'm soaked after that jolt you gave me. It was so oh good. Her hooded gaze drifted down my body. So big. Let me know when you're ready, I said, my voice roughening as my hand slowly de my aroused flesh. I wonder how that will feel inside me, filling, stretching, and scraping inside me she said with a daze. After a few minutes, she grew increasingly frenzied, movements growing erratic. I'll go it's so good. Now, Izuku. Give it to me now, she said so I channeled another surge of magic through our mystical tether. Oh hoys. Yes so oh, that's good she said. Mina's back arched, a primal keen torn from her lips as her release crashed over her in relentless waves. For endless moments, she was a vision of rapturous abandon. 
My own climax rapidly crested as I helplessly drank in her expression of transcendent ecstasy. With a few final, savage s, I sprayed my onto Mina's face and tits. Unexpectedly, she opened her mouth at the right moment, causing some of it to go shoot inside there. Three points. Utterly insensate in her bliss, Mina didn't seem to notice or care about the salacious painting I'd made of her. If anything, she appeared to savor the peculiar sacrament, lapping at the pearlescent streaks with evident relish. I could get used to this taste, she purred once she'd regained some semblance of lucidity, attempting to rise on trembling limbs. Let me clean myself up. Lyment. I watched, entranced, as she casually swiped at the mess I'd made of her with dainty swipes of her tongue. Despite my mind's attempts at rational detachment, arousal burned low in my belly at the sight. Well was it everything you hoped for I managed once she'd put herself to rights. A beatific smile curved her lips. Like a dozen orgasms, back to back. I could get addicted to this. To my seat I couldn't resist the teasing lilt. Mina rolled her eyes. That too. But I meant more getting magic from an evoker instead of some purr from elsewhere. Sobering, I cautioned, I really don't think you should get used to this, Mina. I'm not going to be around to supply you with mystical energy every time you feel the itch. Any further admonitions I might have voiced died on my tongue as she boldly grasped my hand, sucking one finger into the velvet heat of her mouth with shameless relish. The sensual tableau made my breath catch despite my best efforts. What are you doing I rasped once I'd found my voice. Just MMHHMMM leaving you MMMHMM something to dream about tonight. Mina slowly, teasingly released my finger with a soft pop, but not before taking it as deep as it goes. She quirked a sly smile. By the way I have no gag reflex. My now resurgent arousal throbbed insistently at the blatant invitation in her tone. This minx. How much energy did I take are you drained Mina asked with a worried tone. I shook my head. Not more than after a round or two of poker. I could do this all day. It wasn't a lie. I'd already recovered the magic I'd expended several times over before channeling it a second time. Mina's expression morphed into one of surprised wonder. Christ. I knew evokers were stronger than normal mages, but thighs is more magic than I've ever felt, and it's nothing to you. I guess we use a lot of energy when fighting, I said with a nonchalant shrug. I need to think about this. There's got to be a way to get something useful out of this. Planning to find some other evoker to help you the thought irritated me more than I cared to examine. Mina seemed to pick up on my shift in mood, watching me with a new appraisal. Evokers hate us, remember that's probably why nobody's tried this before. But don't worry, I'll come up with something. Her expression hardened with steely determination. I know I can. We lingered in comfortable silence as Mina put herself to rights once more. As I made my way toward the stairs, I felt compelled to offer a final piece of advice. Well, good luck with that. Just don't do anything stupid with the magic I gave you. I won't. See you later, Mina said before me on the cheek and running back to the dorms. Thursday morning dawned, heralding another evoker class. With Achako's absence lingering, I prepared for the lesson, a sigh escaping my lips. At least Andridi could be relied upon, unlike the capricious Sarah. Perhaps he might offer some advice. As I trod the path to the classroom, Nana's raven tresses came into view. Seizing the moment, I greeted her with a flourish, striking a pose reminiscent of a certain general. Hello there. Nana jumped, startled, before bursting into peals of laughter. PFT what's with that? Morning. Anything fun happening I inquired, a sly grin playing on my lips. Her mirth subsided, replaced by a weary exhalation. Far too many family meetings. The Yeyurazus are calling in favors from us and others. Yeyurazu you mean like Yeyurazu Momo's family I clarified. Brows furrowing. You know her. Yeah, she's my classmate, I affirmed. Nana tilted her head skyward, contemplating. Well, she's the one they sent to negotiate. But this directive comes straight from their family head, Lord Yeyurazu himself. Something has them seriously spooked. What's happening I pressed, curiosity peaked. The Yeyurazu clan is renowned for their seers. And they claim something terrible is unfolding. That the confluence last week was merely the beginning of something colossal. Entire pantheons, they say, will perish before this is over, she revealed, solemn. How cheerful. So, yay or Azusan is here to stop it or something I ventured. She shook her head. You can't stop something like that. You can only ensure it's not your family that gets run over by the oncoming train. Whatever cataclysmic force is looming requires an equivalently mighty hammer to counter it. I murmured, recalling Midnight Sensei's words. What? No, nothing. Nothing important, I deflected. Look, Izuku, I like you, but you're a terrible liar. You and Achako were at the heart of whatever happened last week, weren't you Nana challenged, eyes narrowing. No, I denied, averting my gaze. Did you know you tend to look away and to the left whenever you try to lie you've got to be the worst poker player? She chuckled, amused. Which is kinda hilarious, considering how you visualize your power. Ha <laughs> ha. Very funny, I retorted, sarcasm dripping. So, you and Achako stumbled over something. Was it related to the court she prodded? 
I wonder what part of it got her knickers in a twist. Was it an elsewhere Nana speculated, undeterred. Yes, okay, we ran into something in elsewhere. It wasn't about the end of the world, just personal. Between me and Achako. No, we're not doing 20 questions. Now let's go, we'll be late, I urged, attempting to steer the conversation away before divulging too much, but Nana seemed disinclined to relent. Have you spoken to Momo? She inquired. No, I haven't spoken to random strangers about this. I shouldn't have said anything to you, either, I sighed, regretting my candor. Nana, look, if this gets back to Iraq, I'm a dead man, I warned, jaw clenched. Did you achako is that why the world's actually ending cause you couldn't keep your dick in your pants she teased, grinning impishly. No, talk about giving her a world-shaking orgasm. Ha, huh. off. We found a glade near here, I blurted, cursing inwardly. Her expression turned grave, the mirth evaporating. There isn't one. Trust me, I'd know. That's what Achako said as well. But it's there. Like a five-minute walk from the Crowley, I persisted, resolute. Izuku, I've been over every path and elsewhere for hours around here. There's no glade. Not even the remnants of one, she insisted, unwavering. I could only shrug, perplexed. Yeah, but there was one a week ago. That's what has everyone so excited, I explained. She gazed skyward momentarily before replying, we've totally got to go. Have you been back since? No, for some strange reason, I don't have a burning desire to go back, I remarked dryly. Oh, don't be a pussy. How is it Nana prodded, a mischievous glint in her eye. Surprisingly nice, actually, I admitted, recalling the comfortable summer sun over the lake. There's a huge lake, and the weather is perfect for a swim. And we're not there chilling on the beach right the now, because imagine it a couple of cold beers, some revealing swimwear she trailed off suggestively, arching a brow. There's a complication, I sighed. Someone lives there, a woman called Nimu. The lady Nana's interest peaked. Well no you've piqued my interest. What do you know about her I queried. Not much. An old power. She's tied to the Arthurian legend, first as the original guardian of Excalibur. Later as godmother of Lancelot. Not a big fan of the Pendragons, from what I know. Which speaks in her favor as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, she and Ochako got on like a house on fire, I remarked dryly. I imagine. Though why did they get Ochako pissed at you Nana wondered aloud, brows furrowing. Look, Nana, you can't tell anyone about this, I pleaded. I won't hide something that will hurt my family, you know that. But beyond that, I promise. Scout's honor, she vowed solemnly. Drawing a deep breath, I revealed. The lady said I was destined to be the next king in exile. Nana's mouth fell agape, eyes wide with disbelief. You what? Us HHH. Not so loud, I hissed urgently. Erek's going to have a nuclear meltdown if he finds out, she whispered, aghast. No shit. You've got to keep this quiet, Nana. Does Achako know oh, what am I saying? Of course she knows, Nana groaned, face bombing. Jesus in Christ on a paga stick, no wonder she blew a fuse at you. Indeed. The lady is one mean. So, excuse me if I'm not in a rush to go hang out at her private beach resort, I remarked acidly. You can't hide from shit like this, Izuku. Powers are like wolves, they can smell fear, Nana cautioned. So what do you suggest I drag Ochako there again cause that worked out great last time? I scoffed sarcastically. No, why don't we go together just you and me? How about next Friday, after your classes? What, just show up at the doorstep of a power I balked? Oh, the lady ain't bad, as far as powers go. She interacts quite often with us mortals. My dad knew her well. But more importantly, evokers don't back down. Not to powers, not gods, need a fecking dragons. Can of you letting the side down, she chided playfully. Exhaling heavily, I acquiesced, all right. So let's do this, Friday evening at the portal. Aye. Now let's head, we'll be late for class, Nana agreed, setting off purposefully. Sure, I stepped beside her as we proceeded to the evoker classroom. We made our way to the theater, only to be greeted by an empty classroom. So, where's Eindridi Nana queried, glancing around. No idea. He's usually early, I remarked with a frown. The door creaked open as our teacher strode in, a palpable aura of anger and frustration trailing him. Izuku. Nana. Sorry I'm late. The confluence stirred the pot a little, but Lord Yeyurazu's envoys have genuinely brought it to a full boil. It's a mess. What is a confluence I asked, recalling Midnight Sensei's basic explanation, but craving more clarity. Good question, I guess. When you cast most spells, the effect is instant. You throw a fire, you don't wait for several days before it shows up. Eindridi elucidated. Okay I nodded, urging him to continue. There are, however, some spells that require more power than you can deliver directly. Usually you leech ambient energy for days, sometimes years. Whatever the triggered a week ago was years. Likely a lot of them. That seems useful, I mused. How do I do that? You don't. This is enchanter magic. And a good reminder that, while evokers can usually take enchanters in a straight-up fight, a pissed off enchantress left to her own devices can ruin your day in oh so many ways, he cautioned gravely. So what did it do? I'm not totally sure. Obviously a lot of energy went into hiding the glade you stumbled over, he remarked nonchalantly as my body stiffened. Where did he know about it? Ha ha ho, stop pretending. Of course I know. But that's only part of the spell. I don't know what else, though. And that's scaring the hell out of a lot of people right now, he continued, unfazed. Why is that I pressed, heart pounding? 
because there are worse things out there than angry gods or pissed off dragons. Something wiped out the Canaanites and the Assyrians. And someone came within a hair's breadth of doing the same thing to the court, taking out Merlin, Arthur, and doing a full sweep of the round table. Who? No idea. Nobody that deals with gods or mortals. We call them the outsiders, but where that is, nobody knows. The Yeyarazu seem convinced they're coming back, he revealed, features grave. And you believe them. For a thousand years, the Yeyarazu seers have been the best prophets available for hire. They don't take payment in cash, but in favors, and now they're calling those favors as if there is no tomorrow. Which understandably makes people worry there may not be. Yeyarazusin and the fox girl, I muttered. I, though for the love of the gods, don't call her that. She's sensitive about her age. This is probably the first time they've let her down from the mountain, Nana chimed in. And I prompted. And a fox demon is a batting enemy to make. They're not mages, everything is physical for them. They move like nothing you've ever seen, and they hit like a garbage truck. Only way to fight them is to nuke them from a distance, Nana elaborated, deadly serious. It seems like my previous plan was correct. So what brings her here? She's a bodyguard. Likely also an assassin. The Yeyarazu deal in favors, and over the years that has led to some very powerful creatures owing them. And some very powerful alliances, Eindridi explained. Abruptly, a vivid scene unfolded in my mind's eye. A Japanese-style restaurant, the table laden with exquisite dishes. But it wasn't the food that ensnared my attention it was the breathtaking woman seated opposite, raven tresses cascading down her back, piercing golden eyes locking with my own emerald gaze. Her yukata left little to the imagination, while behind her swayed nine ethereal silver tails. As quickly as the vision materialized, it dissipated, leaving me disoriented. Neither Nana nor Eindridi seemed to notice my momentary trance. And Ye Yurazus and I probed, struggling to compose myself. She's the granddaughter of the present Lord Ye Yurazu. If I was to guess, I'd say she's probably also a seer. It runs strongly in the main family of the clan. But mostly, she's here as an ambassador. Anyway, Eindridi segued, shifting topics. Today, I wanted to spend some time talking about how to work with allies in combat. In any pitched battle, evokers will usually be the tip of the spear, with enchanters and healers augmenting their abilities. The lesson proceeded for the remainder of the hour, honing my skills at coordinating with comrades. And that concludes today's lecture. Now, if you kids will excuse me, I need to go find out if the world is ending soon, Eindridi remarked with a chuckle as we wrapped up. Do you really think it's that bad I asked, concern etched into my features. He shook his head ruefully. No, but there's a lot of room between business as usual and the end of the world. The question is where on that spectrum our current problems fall. Either way, I've got to go. See you next week. With a wave, he strode out the door. See you next week, Nana and I echoed. Gathering her belongings, Nana prepared to depart as well. I've got to head as well. See you on Monday. See you, Nana. Alone once more, I readied myself for the next round of lessons, resolving to seek out Midnight Sensei about finally attaining a true flawless gem whatever price she might demand. With the ominous rumblings of calamity pervading the air, bolstering my power felt imperative. Still, a nagging sense of trepidation gnawed at me. Izuku POV. Monday. Achako hadn't returned to the dorms or class. When I spoke to the principal, they gave me little information. Without Achako's guidance, I put my swordsmanship training on pause. I didn't want to accidentally learn improper techniques and have to unlearn them later. My mornings were spent battling and elsewhere to grow stronger. The wild hunt may not be after me yet, but that could change. Getting stronger couldn't hurt. And lately, I found myself staying over the curly more and more. The ease to get to elsewhere from here made it too convenient to pass up. As I walked the familiar path, I spotted a woman with short brown hair. Butterflies erupted in my stomach as adrenaline coursed through me. My heart skipped a beat as I called out, Achako. She turned, and I saw sadness etched on her face for a fleeting moment before it hardened into a stoic mask. Give me your hand she demanded. After nearly two weeks apart, this was how she greeted me not even a hello I knew she had reasons to be angry after our last encounter, but her curt attitude stung. Well, hello to you, too. How are you I've been fine the bitterness seeped into my voice before I could stop it. Ignoring my tone, she repeated, I said give me your godscursed hand, Izuku. I refused to back down either. Why did you make Sarah think I assaulted you? Your hand, she insisted, and then her eyes widened in realization. Wait assaulted who would say such a thing? You insisted on swapping ceremonial magic partners, then disappeared from class. That thought drew her own conclusion, I explained, unable to keep the edge from my words. Her frown deepened. Her conclusion is hers, not mine. Now, give me your hand, Izuku. This is important. Why? Please, Izuku. I need to check something. This is important to me. And you, too. A knot of dread formed in my gut. Did you tell your father I asked carefully? Tell him what? About Nimue. And the prophecy. And the mantle I listed off, bracing for the worst. If she ratted me out, I may need to flee the country, at the very least. Shock flashed across her face, segueing into a frown. I am upset at you for hiding important things from me, Izuku. She shook her head slowly. 
but hardly angry enough to wish you dead, which is what would happen if father perceives you as a threat to the throne. Still not convinced, I pressed, so what do you want to do with my hand try to seal my power so I won't be a threat to your family or something? She wouldn't normally do that, would she but it wasn't uncommon for people to take extreme measures to protect what mattered most, be it family, treasure, or something else. As if I could, she scoffed. I told you, an evoker spark is a bonfire. I would have better luck damming the Thames with my bare hands. She shook her head firmly. My tutor taught me to trace the spell, if it exists. I need to see if Nimi was actually truthful. Now give me your hand. Please, Izuku. I held out my right hand, still a bit skeptical. If it's important to you. Her expression rapidly cycled through determination, shock, then settled into heartbroken devastation. I see it. But it is incredibly subtle. Had I not known to look, I would have never caught it. What did you find I asked, dread pooling in my gut. Two had hoped Nimu spoke falsely, that this was not but a misunderstanding to be corrected. Her voice trailed off as her eyes remained transfixed on my outstretched hand. That we could return to how things were before. So you think some kind of mind control made you fall for me the implications stung, despite the ludicrousness of the idea. She shook her head slowly. No, that is not the case. I sought Lord Anton, the tutor who instructed me in magic. There is no enchantment nor glamour cast upon me. A tension I hadn't realized I carried melted away as relief washed over me. But that's great news, right I began hopefully. It means your feelings for me are real. Horror flitted across her features. And what matters that if mine be real she asked, bewildered. Nimuasi's correct. There dwells a spell upon you. I can feel its tendrils reaching out for me. It is that which compels your perceived love. She repeated the words like a mantra. A lie, all a lie. Maybe the spell has its own reasons for making me like you, I said, gently grasping her chin and meeting her gaze. But I have mine. Though she seemed unconvinced, desperation edged her tone. Nimu spoke truly. I am but a plain-faced maiden with a stick of these. What man could desire me save for my ties to the throne? Don't forget she called you a tomboy, I reminded her wryly. Her scowl at the memory proved that Slate had struck deepest, ironic for one so proud of her knightly ways. Yes, that too, she admitted sourly. Well, I happen to like tomboys, I reassured her. And only the blind could call you plain-faced. You're absolutely stunning. A faint flush tinted her cheeks. And the accusation of mistaburnness. I wouldn't go that far, I said with a slight grin. You can be strict, sure, but it speaks more to your strength of character than anything. Though I certainly won't complain if you relax a bit more going forward. But the spell she remained fixated on that, worry furrowing her brow. I couldn't blame her, learning the object of your affections only reciprocated due to magical machinations would devastate anyone. But that simply wasn't the case here. I don't care about some stupid spell. I fell for you completely of my own free will, I stated firmly. Skepticism clouded her features. How can you be so certain perhaps it merely bends your senses to perceiving me as fair? What if, once the enchantment fades, you find only hatred for me in its wake? Doubtful. I'm no Fuminori, and you're hardly Saya. Trust me, I'd be the first to recognize if my perceptions were that warped. I'm the one who brought up the comparison, but I can't help but shudder at the prospect. She blinked in confusion. Who are these people? Just characters from an old novel, I dismissed with a wave. The point is, that's not our situation here. Hell, most of our male classmates have a thing for you too, spell or no spell. She seemed taken aback by that revelation, rendered momentarily speechless. They just have good taste is all, I continued with a smirk. This isn't some spell messing with my eyes. You're gorgeous, a chaco any man would want you. But I'm the one who intends to keep you. Izuku she began hesitantly. My family. There's nothing you can say that will make me walk away, I stated, brooking no argument. Now come on, we'll be late for class if we linger. But first, what are you HMMP stepping forward and leaning down? I pulled her into a tender but passionate, putting actions to my reassuring words. For that fleeting moment, I hope to chase away any lingering doubts about the authenticity of my love. I've missed you, Ochako. More than words can express. Don't abandon me like that again, I told her, drinking in her presence. Are you crazy someone could see us she glanced around nervously, checking for onlookers. Let them. There's nothing we can't handle together. I squeezed her hand reassuringly. My father would have a heart attack if he knew, she fretted. I shrugged. Your father already has plenty of reasons to want me dead. He just doesn't know it yet. But if you really want me to stop I trailed off meaningfully. Just tell me you don't want this. Several charged seconds ticked by as she remained silent, eventually leaning her head against my answer enough. See a grin tugged at my lips. This time, she initiated the, a soft escaping as she pressed herself flush against me. For that singular moment, time seemed to still, attuned only to the thrumming of her heart against mine. Hi Izuku. Achako. I see the rumors of your breakup arrovastated. Nana's unexpected arrival startled Achako, who whipped around with wide, panicked eyes. Nana oh gods what did you see? Nothing I'm sure she hasn't seen before, I reassured Achako with a wry chuckle. I, but Izuku, try to be a bit more careful. Yeah, Nana warned. The court ain't like us folk. Shit could get real messy, real fast. Pick the meanest looking guy in the pub I began Riley, and kick him square in the ass, she finished with a snort. I, I know that dance well enough. Most don't start off aiming for demigods though. Can't fault your ambition. 
Did anyone else see us? I asked, only partially joking. Nah, I kept a lookout. Though I was starting to wonder when you two'd come up for air. Nana smirked. A lover's quarrel mended, I take it. Something like that, I replied as we made our way to the DGN1 classroom. Achako still flushed and dazed. As we walked, I noticed Nana seemed in unusually high spirits for someone about to face ceremonial magic class with Sarah. Curiously, I asked about her buoyant mood. I, well I just got some good family news. Cheered me right the up, she said with a rakish grin. Not even that Sarah can spoil my day now. Good for her, I supposed. As for me, having reconciled with Achako, nothing could possibly go wrong. And DGN1. Welcome to yet another ceremonial magic class. Surprisingly enough, everyone is present. For once, Sarah announced as we filed in. Morning, Professor, I greeted, taking a seat between Achako and Nana. Sarah fixed me with a pointed look. Mr. Midoriya, I know you cling to the hope that if you simply keep avoiding the written assignment, I'll forget about it. I assure you, that's a flawed assumption. I shrugged nonchalantly. Welp, let me be clear, you will not graduate this course without submitting it. I've discussed this with the principal. Have I made myself understood she arched an expectant brow? I nodded, mind on more pressing matters than homework. Good. I shall assume this issue is now resolved, she stated crisply. Miss Sarah, I have something I'd like to ask you, I began. What is it? There was some miscommunication last week. Achako and I had no plans to switch partner assignments, I explained. Is that so Sarah's gaze shifted to Achako? That seems quite different from what I heard previously, Miss Pendragon. Are you certain you aren't being pressured I'm aware of your resources, but any coercion happening here? Not at all, Professor, Achako assured her. It was simply a misunderstanding between us. I was wrong to disrupt the group dynamics over such a trifling matter. I ask forgiveness. Seemingly satisfied, Sarah nodded. Well said. No apology needed then we'll revert to the original pairings. Thank you, Miss Sarah, I said gratefully. With that settled, let's examine the role of voice control in ceremonial rituals as the lesson commenced. I felt an odd sense of increasing charisma. After dismissing the class with our next assignment, Sarah pulled me aside. Izuku, would you mind staying a moment I have a few clarifications. Sure, I agreed easily. Something happened around 10 days ago, Sarah began, eyes narrowed. I don't know what, exactly, but I despise being kept in the dark. Playing dumb, I feigned confusion. What happened, Miss Sarah? Her expression hardened. Don't play coy with me. An immensely powerful confluence occurred, stronger than anything I've sensed before. And immediately after, the future queen abandons her evoker bow you were at the heart of it. Her frustration was palpable, but I felt no compulsion to satisfy her curiosity. I have no idea, Miss Sarah. I had a few drinks and went to bed early. You know how bad we evokers are at sensing that kind of stuff. Sarah remained skeptical, staring me down for several tense seconds. Finally, unable to detect any deception, she relented with a huff. Have it your way, then. But I will find out what happened. Eventually. Sure you will, I thought inwardly, keeping my tone light. Find out what, Miss Sarah. She scoffed at my fox innocence. Anyway, I'm glad you and the princess reconciled for this assignment. It wouldn't have been nearly as entertaining to pair you with Mina instead. Her eyes glinted. Do enjoy yourselves. Well, that didn't sound ominous at all. Offering my thanks, I turned and headed upstairs, quickly putting Sarah's veiled threats out of mind. I had more important things to focus on now. After school at the Crowley. After school, Achako and I made our way to Crowley's, aiming to knock out the homework early if possible. More importantly, it was a chance to recapture our previous casual intimacy. So, we are back here once again, dear knight. It feels a lifetime has passed since our last visit. Achako mused. It really does, I agreed. Though hopefully this time you won't completely freak out on me. She arched an inquisitive brow. You refer to that time I uncovered a 1600-year-old conspiracy aimed at letting my lover steal my throne. While her tone held a teasing lilt, I could tell the wound was still fresh. Best to reassure her. It's your father's throne, not yours, I gently corrected. Anyway, I just mean don't automatically assume I have ill intentions. I really don't. And how can I be certain of that she challenged? Looking into her eyes, I spoke from the heart. Because there's nothing I wouldn't give for you, Achako. We will be together, in this world and the next. I love you. She seemed taken aback by my earnest declaration. Love are you truly certain of that or is it merely what all boys in this realm say to maidens in hopes of disrobing them? Yes I answered simply with a shrug. Bachako blinked. Yes to which part of my query? A smirk played across my lips. All of it. Yes, I love you wholeheartedly. Yes, I'm utterly certain of my feelings. And yes, I added impishly, admitting our love is a time-honored tactic for getting girls out of their clothes. I couldn't resist adding with a wink, though in this case, simply mentioning our homework also seems to do the trick. Are you so certain this will involve nudity again what was last week's homework? You haven't done it yet maybe we could do it together. I paused then asked, just out of curiosity, do you know how to do a handstand I mean without the use of your quirk? Why are you asking she questioned. No, nothing. Nothing at all, I deflected. Anyway, I guess I've done it with Mina already, so too late. Though I'd be more than happy to help you complete your half of it, I plainly told her. Her face then turned severe as she asked with cold fury in her eyes, what? 
did you do with Mina? That's a rather fierce look, I observed. My boyfriend is doing Yule homework with the ceremonial mage, and I am supposed to just be okay with that she demanded. Well, next time, don't leave me lying around like lost luggage, waiting for another girl to pick me up. She glared at me, deep jealousy obvious in her eyes. I guess I better clear this up now before anybody gets in trouble. Oh, don't look at me like that. Nothing happened. Well, I didn't touch her. She never intended to complete the assignment anyway. I told her. I'll take your word for now. But we'll discuss this later. Today, let's focus on our assignment, she stated firmly. After you, my lady, I gestured to the staircase. Ever the gentleman, she flirted, her speech matching mine once again. As a bonus, I get to watch your ass when you're walking up the stairs. We both entered the room where I sometimes spend the night. Shall we uncover Sarah's latest scheme, she inquired. Sure, you take the lead this time, I said, passing her the letter. Let's see. Let's see giving and receiving pleasure lies at the core of ceremonial magic. For today's task, you'll guide your partner to climax, she read aloud. Looks like we're already ahead of the curve, I remarked. Indeed, she chuckled. What's the attire this time, I inquired. Same as last time, bathed in moonlight. And no, that still doesn't mean we're taking it outside, she said, quickly dismissing the notion. Seems like there's a misunderstanding here. I'm not into exhibitionism. Okay then, let's get undressed, I suggested. I do not know if I will ever get used to this, she murmured as she removed her shirt, revealing flawless skin. Her gentle curves concealed the tone muscles she'd honed during her training. Oh, it'll be fine. Don't stop, I assured her, unable to contain my smirk at the sight before me. It had been too long. She unhooked her bra, revealing her wonderful twin mounds with pink areola, and asked, are you not going to undress too? I'm just enjoying the view, it's been a while. And can I just say, I appreciate you taking the lead with the bra it suits you, I complimented her. She proceeded to shimmy out of her pants, leaving only her panties, and remarked, I remember, yes. Are you planning to wait until I'm completely naked before you get dressed? Yes, why not I'm not going to miss a moment, I replied. But you've seen me naked before, she pointed out. Some things are always a delight, I confessed, my gaze fixed on her. And there's a unique pleasure in watching you undress for me. Her skin glowed softly under the candlelight as she slowly stripped off her underwear. She smiled at me when she was done, looking ready to begin. How did I get such a perverted boyfriend she teased as she slowly took off her panties and laid it on the bed along with her other articles of clothing. You're just lucky, I guess, I told her. The spectacle is over. Now it's your turn, she declared, turning towards me. I don't see you averting your gaze, I teased. Last time I tried that, she quickly looked away, but now she continued to stare. Turnabout is fair play. Perhaps your habits are rubbing off on me, she suggested. Now there's a pleasant thought. And rubbing off while thinking of you. But that may be TMI, I smirked. I almost dread to ask what that means, she remarked. I'd be delighted to demonstrate later, I assured her. Like last time, I assume, she said, raising an eyebrow. If you lie down, I'll help you with your little predicament. It's hardly little, I retorted. Really I don't have much to compare it to, she said before correcting herself, lie down, and I'll help you with your big predicament. First, it's my turn, I reminded her. She cocked her head to the side, a finger pressed against her cheek. Is that not what I've been saying? Okay, she clearly missed the point. No, I meant it's my turn to give you pleasure. Give and take, as the assignment said. Izuku she looked at me with uncertainty. Yes, I prompted. This is a terrible idea. I must remain until marriage. Our relationship is already a defiance against my father, but there are boundaries I cannot cross, she confessed. Right. Don't worry. I'll respect your boundaries, I reassured her. But the assignment involves giving and receiving pleasure. If you wanted to cheat, you could have done so while we were still clothed, I pointed out. I did take pleasure in giving you what did you call it a handjob there was something captivating about seeing your reaction as you orgasmed, knowing I caused it. For you, she admitted, her cheeks red as a tomato. Trust me. Can you do that, Achako I asked, offering reassurance once more. I would never do anything to harm you. I uh, yes. Yes, I'll trust you. I should have trusted you over Nimu. What should I do, she inquired. Just lie down on the bed, I instructed. On the bed, Izuku. Don't worry, your ID is safe, I assured her, letting the information sink in. When she remained silent, I continued, your chastity, however, might be in jeopardy. Now, please, lie down for me. Lime warning. She complied with my request, settling her head on the pillow. I will trust you, she murmured. Positioning myself over her, I had a close-up view of her usually sleek hair now tousled on the bed, giving her an enticingly disheveled appearance. It might just be me, but I found it incredibly why. I began with awe on her lips, starting gently and gradually intensifying. Exploring her mouth with my tongue, I elicited soft s from her. MMMHMMMM this feels so different from our usual ease, she remarked, wrapping her hands around my neck, fingers tangling in my hair. Just relax, I encouraged her. You'll enjoy this. I promise. I will try, she replied as we parted our lips. Moving on, I at her ear, her cute elven ear flushing pink along with the rest of her face. Up close, I caught a whiff of her fresh scent, laced with lavender and floral notes from her shampoo. Oh god, she exclaimed in a high-pitched, excited tone, confirming her enjoyment. 
I teased the tip of her ear, discovering its exquisite sensitivity. A delightful revelation for future encounters. The way it flaps around is adorable too. I've never seen it like that. Nibbling and ink gently, I maximized her pleasure before switching my focus to her cheekbone, tracing a path from her earlobe down. Our gaze is locked, and for a moment, I was captivated by the brilliance in her auburn eyes, brighter than any star, before it faded away as she surrendered to my ease. Once more, I savored the taste of her lips, feeling her eager breath against mine as we parted. Her face was flushed, a Y expression lingering on her features. I shifted my focus to her collarbone, eliciting a soft shudder from her as her breath quickened. Tracing a path from her collarbone to the base of her throat, I could feel the stiffness of her nipples against my, her heartbeat reverberating through me. Planting it in the center of her, I noticed the mix of hope and concern in her expression. Continuing with the series of ease, I eventually reached her exquisite mounds, my head coming to rest on her, where I could hear the rapid rhythm of her heart. A faint sheen of sweat glistened on her skin, and on impulse, I sampled it with my tongue, surprising her and eliciting as she lifted her lower body slightly. Someone's feeling eager, I thought, as I massaged her enticing curves. But there was no need to rush. Enclosing one of her nipples with my mouth, her fingers dug into my thigh. Sensitive, aren't they do you like it I teased, playing with her nipples with my tongue. She remained silent so I let my hand onto her other nipple, gently squeezing it. I'm not hearing an answer, I continue teasing her nipples, alternating between ing while running circles around it, and sucking with my mouth that, at times enough to lift her ass, and twirling and squeezing them with my right hand. Based on her reactions and how warm her skin is, I wouldn't be surprised if she climaxed just like this. But that would be premature, so I released her nipple from my mouth, leaving it glistening with saliva, though my hand remained in place for a bit. Do you like this or should I do something else I continue to tease? Yes. I mean, no. Keep going, she replied, her breathless voice filled with desire. Tracing ease down her stomach, I made my way tantalizingly close to her hips, heightening the anticipation between us. Just as I was about to delve into her most intimate depths, I veered slightly to the side, teasing her with every move. Lifting her legs, I reveled in the exclusive view of her most secret place, an exquisite sight that stirred a primal hunger within me. The glistening moisture of her arousal only fueled my desire. Running my finger along her smooth inner thigh, I teased back and forth, teasingly close to her throbbing clit before pulling away, savoring her reaction. Watching the glazed desire in her eyes, I trailed my finger downwards to the delicate pink of her sphincter, which opened and contracted in response to my touch. Gently caressing the edges of her buttocks, I savored the sensation of her soft skin beneath my fingertips. Izuku she called out, her voice a mixture of confusion and longing, not yet fully comprehending the depths of pleasure I intended to take her to. I think we can save this for another time, don't you agree? Achako I whispered, my voice a husky murmur laden with promise. I I do not understand. Why are you touching me there she asked, her innocence only serving to ignite the fire burning within me. With deliberate care, I began to caress her sensitive clit with my fingers, feeling her arousal build with each. Her s grew more urgent as I explored her s folds, the intoxicating scent of her desire filling the air. Hem that feels incredible. Please, don't stop, she pleaded, her voice a breathy whisper that only fueled my desire further. With a wicked grin, I continued to tease her throbbing clit, reveling in the way her body responded to my touch. Oh gods, please Izuku she cried out, her words a desperate plea for more as I pushed her ever closer to the edge of ecstasy. Responding to her primal need, I quickened my pace, sending waves of pleasure coursing through her body. Her hips pressed against my hand, her breath coming in ragged gasps, as she surrendered herself to the blissful sensation washing over her. That feels strange. Nice. Keep going, she said, her voice a mixture of surprise and pleasure. Encouraged by her words, I had my way down until my lips hovered over her throbbing clitoris. Gently parting her delicate folds, I exposed her swollen bud to the warm air, a tantalizing sight that made my mouth water with anticipation. With a purposeful motion, I enveloped her clit with my lips, tasting the salty sweetness of her desire. A slight suction caused her hips to lift from the bed, her body reacting as if electrified by the sensations coursing through her. I continued to suckle her, occasionally fing my tongue across her clit from one side to the other, but never releasing it from my lips. Achako's noises grew more urgent, her hips bucking uncontrollably as waves of pleasure crashed over her. I could feel her shuddering breaths deep in her stomach, her thighs pressing against my head as she surrendered herself completely to the pleasure I was giving her. With each passing moment, her arousal intensified, driving her closer to the edge of ecstasy. I quickened my pace, determined to take her over the edge and into the blissful oblivion she craved. Her urgent cries filled the air, echoing off the walls as I brought her to the pinnacle of pleasure. With one final surge of intensity, she climaxed, her body convulsing in ecstasy, 
as she reached the peak of her pleasure. After a moment, I decided it was enough for now. Despite her obvious enjoyment, I could sense that she wasn't quite accustomed to such intense stimulation, and the sensitivity of her body made it clear that she needed a moment to recover. Plus, the ache of my own desire was becoming almost unbearable, my arousal reaching a fever pitch that demanded release. That had been almost too much fun, and I couldn't wait to continue exploring every inch of her until she was begging for more. Oh god Izuku that was wonderful. I never imagined I feel so weak, I can barely move, she confessed, her voice trembling with satisfaction. Well, that does leave me with a big problem, I remarked with a smirk. What her confusion was evident until she realized her thighs were still tightly wrapped around me. Oh yeah just let me catch my breath. My body is still trembling, she said, finally relaxing her legs and freeing me from her embrace. It was the best kind of imprisonment, snoo snoo divided by ten. But I needed to take care of this arousal. Just relax. Let me show you what I meant about rubbing off on you, I told her. After a few seconds, she was able to move her legs and let me free. Best prison ever, snoo snoo divided by ten but I'll need to take care of this. Positioning myself so that my throbbing member was just inches away from her face, I began to myself. Her gaze was fixed on my movements, curiosity evident in her eyes. What do you usually think about when you pleasure yourself like that she inquired? Depends. But right now, I'm thinking of you. Your ass as you reached climax. The softness of your ass in my hands. The taste of your essence. The scent of your arousal. How utterly beautiful you looked lying there, I confessed, bringing myself closer to the edge as I recalled our encounter just moments ago. You make it sound quite erotic, she remarked, her voice filled with a mixture of surprise and intrigue. Very much so. I assure you, it won't be the last time I fantasize about that memory, I assured her. That makes me feel special. I worry I may not be quite normal, she admitted. Nonsense. It's perfectly normal for lovers to find pleasure in each other's memories, I reassured her. So our lovers know she asked tentatively. Oh yes. I promise to protect your ID, not your chastity, I reminded her with a playful grin. I have enjoyed this so very much. Though I worry it makes me the worst ever, she confessed. Oh, we still have two other holes before we get there, I told her, already planning for the future, also moving me closer to the edge. What do you mean she asked, puzzled. Nothing at all by the way, could you do something for me I requested. What, could you give it I asked, my desire evident. She seemed taken aback. Give what a, that, you know, Mydic, I clarified, a hint of mischief in my voice. You want me to give you a blowjob she asked, surprised. I'm sorry, Izuku, but I'm completely exhausted. And I'm not sure if I'm ready for that just yet, she declined. No, not a blowjob. Just a, a peck on the head, and tell it that it's done a great job, I explained. Perhaps it has. After everything you've done for mean to me she adds softly as she relived the memory. Oh yes I echoed, feeling myself nearing my peak. You've been a very naughty dick. Filling my thoughts and dreams with all sorts of lewd fantasies. But I still love you, she said, giving a lingering to the tip of my cock. As she pulled away, her tongue darted out, giving the glands a teasing. She looked up at me with a mischievous glint in her eyes. Like that my night she asked. Yes just like that. Can I release on your ass I asked eagerly. Like last time of course, my night, she agreed without hesitation. Thank you. I adore your ass, they're perfect, I complimented her. You seem almost ready to climax, she observed. Yes, I'm almost there, I confirmed. Then release all over my ass, my dearest night. Release for me, she urged. Oh, God, I murmured as I surrendered to the ecstasy, releasing my essence onto her perfect s. Lyment. Well, that made a mess, she said with a giggle. I shall require a shower. Hopefully my legs will carry me by now, though I still feel quite jittery. Never have I felt anything like that. There's a spare towel by the bed, I said casually. Do you want a shower together I asked mischievously. I think we have both indulged in enough temptation for today. However, I would not be opposed to such an activity someday, she replied, her tone more formal. I'll look forward to it, I told her, feeling hopeful. She made her way to the bathroom with the towel. That girl's something else, I thought. Man, this is the best homework ever, I muttered with a grin. I'll just have to wait for Achako. Too bad she took all her dress. I'd have loved to see her getting dressed. After several minutes, she walked out of the bathroom, all cleaned up. I have returned, dearest knight. Please forgive my delay, she said formally. It's alright. Do you want me to walk you back to the dorms I asked. She tilted her head, unsure of my meaning. My knight, are you saying you're sleeping here? Yeah, at least for now. It's much more convenient to stay here and enter elsewhere to train anyway. Besides, this way I can work late without worrying about the curfew. I told her nonchalantly. I understand, she said, deep in thought. So do you want me to walk you to the dorms? She then shook her head and cupped my cheek, nay. A solitary stroll shall help clear my mind. I fear I tread a path towards catastrophe, yet I am loath, or unable, to halt my steps. I love you. We will do this. Together, I declared to her simply. Indeed. Together we shall persevere, she said as she hugged me tight and grasped my hand. I'll see you tomorrow, I said, giving her on her forehead. I watched as Achako descended the stairs and exited the building. As the door closed behind her, I let out a contented sigh and flopped back down on the bed. 
What a day, I said out loud to the empty room with a goofy grin plastered on my face. My mind replayed the intense experiences we had shared just hours earlier. I really do love her, I muttered, gazing up at the ceiling. The reality of those words washed over me with a mix of elation and nervousness about what the future held. I knew Achako had her reservations and concerns, but her willingness to keep moving forward, even if hesitantly, gave me hope that she felt the same way. Together, I repeated her parting words out loud. Yeah, whatever comes next, we'll face it together. With that reassuring thought, I felt my eyes growing heavy. Before I knew it, I had drifted off to sleep, dreaming about the girl who had well and truly captured my heart.